During that wait, I suffered a lot of pain because all I could remember was Kevin Sullivan beating on me and I was seeing him through a film of my own blood. And when the surgeon got here and sewed me up, he told me that despite everything he could do, I'm going to have a scar here. And that means that every time I look in the mirror, when I'm shaving for the rest of my life, I'm going to see a scar and I'm going to think of Kevin Sullivan. And that's the last memory I have of him is him pounding on me and I cannot go to my grave with that memory in my mind. The memory I want in my mind of Kevin Sullivan, when I see this scar and I think of Kevin Sullivan, I want the memory of him where he is both physically and emotionally and mentally a broken man. I don't want to just break his arms and his legs. I want to break his heart and I want to warp his mind. He hit me with his best shot and he busted me open, but he didn't even knock me down or knock me out. Well, Sullivan, if your friends hadn't come down here and pulled me off you, I would have beat you and finished it right there. I want a match with you that will finish it once and for all till the best man wins. I quit Texas death. I don't care what kind of match it is until one man cannot continue because you and I both know in that last 30 seconds we were alone, you and I both know that I was the better man. And welcome back to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. And I am your co-host, Ray Russell, along for the fun ride. And I hope you guys had a happy and safe holiday weekend. Yes, hope everybody had a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Boxing Day. Hopefully everybody had a great time here as we close out 2023, heading into the new year of 2024. And this week, oh man, do we have a show in store for you now, every show is a fun time here with Bob, but this one specifically I have been looking forward to for many reasons, as we are going to kick the door wide open on the narrative that Bob Roop attempted to steal the San Francisco territory. There's so much more to that story that's always left out. And for those out there who consider themselves students of the game, potential wrestling historians in training, if you will, wanting to be educated on the history of the business, this is the episode for you because we're going to talk about everything that led up to Bob's departure from the San Francisco territory, courtesy of promoter Roy Shire. And believe me, guys, if the only story you've ever heard is the one that goes around on the message boards or in other podcasts that shall not be named here, then be prepared to finally be informed of the entire story. Because if that's all you've heard, you only know about 5% of it. Stay tuned. As also this week, we're going to talk about the conclusion of the epic feud between Bob Roop and Kevin Sullivan. Three more months worth of storyline to go. Three more big matches on the horizon at the Cow Palace. Going to draw over 12,000 strong all the way through the end of the year between Roop and Kevin Sullivan. Going to finish that out, and then we're going to head into the big story here involving Bob Roop's departure from San Francisco. But first, just a friendly reminder, guys, that you can listen to the Wrestling Stoop with Bob Roop and our sister shows like the Wrestling Memory Grenade currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project and also the Regional Wrestling Podcast where we talk the territories. That's right, guaranteed 100% territory talk each and every time out there on the show. Got three projects going on right now on Regional Wrestling including 1981 in Georgia with Jamie Ward, 1986 in Bill Watts' UWF, with Roman Gomez, and now Memphis 1985 with the likes of Steve Crawford, and most recently, Gene Jackson has joined the show. Be sure to check those out. And you can listen to those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google, and beyond. And be sure to follow me on social media, guys. You can follow the brand over at X, formerly the Twitter. You can find us there at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like us, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. You can follow us there for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips 
and pictures from throughout wrestling history. And hey, don't forget to friend Bob Roop over on Facebook.com slash poor Bob Roop. Bob, looking forward to hearing from each and every one of you. And while you guys are at it, why not stop over to YouTube.com slash wrestling grenade where I try to upload new old school footage each and every week. And of course, now would be a tremendous time to become a WrestleCopia patron, guys, talking about that $5 all-access tier. And you can find us there at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. Yes, indeed, five bucks going to get you all sorts of gifts, including my insanely detailed book-like show notes for the Wrestling Memory Grenade, Monday Warfare, and the Regional Wrestling Podcast. You'll also get early access to many of the podcasts here on WrestleCopia, where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. Then from there, it's remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show, covering the 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality, plus new content and conversation never heard before. But that's still not all. You also get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. And as of this week, this holiday week, I have given the gift of doubling the digital downloads this month, something like a couple dozen, maybe more, new digital downloads here in the month of December, all for your viewing and reading pleasure. And of course, here part of that $5 all-access tier, it's also the Patreon-exclusive watch-along series, covering many past WWF and WCW events. And as I said, all of this for the low, low price of just $5. No subscription, cancel any time. Give it a try for just a month, guys. I think you'll like the content that I offer, and every penny of it goes right back here into paying the bills at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. So please, if you can, help keep this brand up and running for the months and the years to come. All right, guys, it's time to jump back into things. As we finish the story of 1977, Bob Roop's entire year in the San Francisco Territory. And who better to tell the tale than the man himself as we go back and he continues to tell us his first-hand experiences as we close out the feud, the epic, fiery feud against Kevin Sullivan, and then we talk about the demise of the relationship between the promoter Roy Shire and his booker, Bob Roop. And in order to do that, we got to bring him back on the show. It is the legend himself. Welcome back, Bob Roop. Hopefully you found some time to relax over the holidays. Well, thanks, Ray. I, I have. It's. I tell you what's really nice is not having to wake up at 4:30 in the morning. But on the same token, I, you know, I'm a widower. My dear wife passed away a while back, and and we have a bachelor pad here, and uh, with addition of a cat. Folks, <laughs> yeah. folks out there, you hear my cat? I'm sorry. My darling Sophie, she likes my company, and I don't have a cage to put her in. So, if you hear her chirping from time to time, she's she's keeping me company here. I hope hope what you hear is not feedback. She's she's criticizing me, but um, <laughs> yeah. Back to you know, I sleep when I'm tired. My bed is a lazy boy. It's the other chair I'm in when uh, you know watching TV and everything. All I have to do is put it back, and you know I'm in bed. So I sleep when I'm tired. And that might be the middle of the day, might be the middle of the night. So I don't have like a regular schedule. Now, of course, when my wife was still here, she was like a normal human being. So we had a, you know, t regular type schedules day, being active during the day and, and, you know, resting at night. But we're not that way. And plus, my youngest son stays up most of the night playing video games and working on stuff he does. But we did make a long answer to a short question. Yeah, we're <laughs> rested up and, and feeling good. I hope oh, that's good to hear. I hope everybody out there, anyone listening to this, is in the same boat. Yeah, I want to say to everybody out there, we appreciate all the feedback we got on the last episode. Ask Bob anything. Lots of questions covered. And yes, we didn't get to everything, but, but I did save them, guys. So for those who didn't have their questions answered, there will be an Ask Bob 2 somewhere down the line when we can squeeze it in. Uh, but for now, this week, Bob, we're going to jump back in and we're going to tell the final piece of the story here, your run in the San Francisco Territory circa 1977. Ray, I want to interject a couple things first, sure. uh, please. For fans out there, uh, although it can't be very satisfying, your question might be answered not by the question itself, by our normal uh, going through what we're going to divulge over the next year's. 
Uh, but if it isn't, we might be answering your question two or three years from now. And I hope that that's not a big, you know, that doesn't turn you off and say, well, I don't want to know anymore. Uh, <laughs> but we'll get to it eventually because we're going to be doing this for a while. The second thing, I want to close a chapter. Uh, I talked in a past uh, episode about Jimmy Golden yeah. and Jimmy Jimmy having a, a, a experience where uh, he thought he committed a serious crime and he he ran out of town. And <laughs> it's funny because it's weird, but wait till you're 81, then you might be able to understand what I'm talking about. But talking about the part I did talk about was nagging at me. I didn't remember exactly how it started. So without even my, me directing my memory to do anything, it did it on its own. And I all of a sudden woke up or came around the corner of my own thoughts and remembered that I got to get that whole episode started. I got a call. I got a telephone call from a girl that and I was single at the time and I wasn't living with anybody. And I got a call from a girl that I knew well enough for her to have my phone number, I guess. And she said that she'd seen Jimmy at the airport and he was rushing through there and he was apparently still in the clothes that he had <laughs> had on when he, when he got burns. No eyebrows at all. You no, know, but I'm not sure he'd even changed clothes. So, I mean, it was such a strange report from her. That that's why I was because I was thinking and after how did I why how and why did I get in touch with Ricky Gibson, and that was why there was no we didn't have cell phones then there was no way to reach Jimmy uh, so I called Ricky and uh, now I just want to add one thing to that Jimmy if you're listening uh, please understand uh, I want everybody to know I think you're a first class guy great heart very very decent person nice human being charming sweet kind. And it'll make you feel better. As we go down the list here, you're going to hear things from me about myself that are far more embarrassing than this little story about you. The reason I'm telling it is because it humanizes us as wrestlers. We make mistakes just like everybody else. And I, I and also people want to know what's going on behind the scenes. So I don't mean to embarrass you in any way. And it's, it's long over. Uh, you'll find out. I'm going to say some things about my own actions and mistakes they're going to make you feel you feel like you didn't do anything anything untoward at all. Okay. Like, for example, uh, <laughs> letting anyone, I mean, any other person know if you're planning a hostile takeover. <laughs> you let anybody else know you've already doomed yourself to failure. I'm talking about one person. That's an example. <laughs> a lesson of, learned there. Yeah, a lesson learned. So, you know, anyway, I, always, you know okay. I, 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 you know, it's funny when I call this lighthearted, you know, when you tell, I wanted to call it a lighthearted story in regards to Jimmy Golden setting a car on fire. But at the same time, man, you know, there's a ton of wrestlers out there that have told a lot worse stories about other, other comrades, if you will. So I didn't, you know, yeah. take offense to it. I'm not Jimmy Golden by any means, but I don't know Jimmy Golden either. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it was clear when you were telling the story, it was in, you know, looking back and having a good laugh, you know, with one of the boys, so to speak. So hopefully, like you said, Jimmy didn't take it, you know, to any offense. And again, you've done nothing but put him over as a great human being. So I just laughed. Oh. And I think a lot of people enjoyed that story. They didn't look at it as anything negative at Jimmy Golden. If anything, it just gave him another reason to to love him. Yeah, humanize him. Yeah, he's like he was a young, young guy at the time and not worldwide. You get in the wrestling business, you're in well, what do we call it? The bubble. Sure. You've got no no exit. Very few avenues that you can behave like a normal human being. You you have to do it in private. Because even if you're a good guy, baby face, you go out in public and people come up to you. And we make ourselves public figures so sure. that people feel like it's okay to come up. And if you if you don't want to talk or give an autograph or whatever, it's like you're being rude. So yeah, uh, it's a it's a weird life. And uh, anyway. Jimmy, uh, best to you, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to have Jimmy on here sometime or talk some That'd more Jimmy great. Golden. We, we, you know, we get to Knoxville. I can't wait to talk a little bit more about Jimmy Golden. He's just, just one of the many, many names from that era that just is not talked about enough. Uh, a lot of, like I said, oh, a lot of uh, people that grew up in my era, the 80s and 90s, they'll remember him for his run as bunkhouse buck, uh, sort of a bunkhouse, rough, rugged character. Uh, definitely not the handsome man of the 1970s and even the 80s, the way they had him with the cow lick and the, the five o'clock shadow there wearing the long johns as a gimmick in WCW. But at least he got a payday there, you know, uh, w working alongside his cousin, Robert Fuller, who was his manager at that time in the 1990s. So 
Yeah, I can't wait to talk a little bit more about Jimmy Golden down the road. But Bob, we've got so much to get into this week on the San Francisco territory because we're going to close out your feud with Kevin Sullivan. But then what everybody's been waiting for, the true story, the real story, the facts, guys, behind what really went on in the Roy Shire territory, the fallout between Bob Roop and the promoter Roy Shire. Can't wait to get there. And who is Louis Miller? You guys will know all about Louis Miller before this episode is over. Well, it sounds good. I guess it's onward and upward. So here we go. We're going to head back to the Kevin Sullivan feud. We've seen the Star Warrior unmasked. We've seen you lay out Kevin's father, George, on the la- I believe it was the last episode we covered here on the show. Uh, and, right. but, and then Sullivan gets fined for his father's troubles for getting in the ring. Sullivan fined his father in the hospital. Oh, woe is Kevin. So we go back in time now. That was in August, late August. Uh, but in September, Bob, it's, you actually step in the ring with Dean Ho. You drop the TV title to Dean Ho on September 17th at the Cow Palace when he wins the first fall of a title versus title match. Of course, at this point, he is the U.S. champion, but you were the TV champion. The rules stated that the TV title on the line for the first fall. Dean Ho wins that, captures the TV title. So technically, he's double champion, dual champion, at least for a moment. But in that same two out of three fall match, Bob, you also win the United States title from Dean, scoring falls number two and three. So when you face Kevin Sullivan again on October 22nd now, you're now the U.S. champion, the top champion in the company. So not only is Kevin now vying for family revenge, but also a shot at the top title in the territory. And as the October 22nd title match went, a two out of three fall encounter between the champion Bob Roop and Kevin Sullivan, it would indeed be Kevin scoring the first fall over you, Bob. But on the second fall, the match broke down into a wild melee between you two. And it finally came to a head. The gloves were off. You guys were throwing down, not adhering to the referee. Just a wild, bloody, knockdown, drag out brawl. What Jim Ross would call a slobber knocker, folks. And that led to the referee trying to break it up, separate you two. But both you and Kevin, so absorbed within your own rivalry, you continue to throw punches at one another. Kevin even catching the referee with a forearm in the midst of all the chaos leaving the referee down and out with no other option than to call for the bell, disqualifying both of you in the process there in fall number two. But it's not over yet, because as the bell sounds, you guys aren't registering it. You don't hear it. The wild chaos continues on. The locker room empties out as just about everyone comes out to try and separate you two. It's literally a pull-apart brawl between Kevin Sullivan and Bob Roop, as every time you and Kevin are separated, You both find a way to get back at each other, and the crowd is eating it up here. They are rocking in the Cow Palace, as Sullivan is just relentless as the babyface who simply can't take it anymore. He has snapped at this point. Maybe Bob Roop is the reason he became that Prince of Darkness, but you aren't exactly running here either, Bob. You're coming right back at Kevin, which is important because on the following TV after this matchup, we learned that both Sullivan and Roop were fined $1,000 for striking the official, but Kevin... He's a changed man now. He just seems different. Doesn't seem to mind the fine. This time around, he complained before when he was fined for injuring you. He complained before when he was fined for his father getting involved in the match. Poor dad. Not only is Roy Shire not covering the hospital bills, but he's charging Kevin Sullivan a grand for his father getting involved. And now this time, fined again, as are you, Bob. But this time, Sullivan doesn't seem to mind it. As he also pointed out here in this promo that for the first time in the history of the U.S. title, that the champion, you, did not score a single fall in the championship match. And remember, it was Kevin winning the first fall and then that double DQ to end the night, giving Kevin momentum for a rematch and another crack at the gold. Now, Bob, you also went on TV that same episode, and you all heard a brief clip of this promo at the beginning of this week's show. I played it a couple weeks back as well. Roop talking about the 19 stitches put in his forehead, making the camera zoom in to show you just how real it was. The big gash on your forehead there, Bob. You stated that every time you look in the mirror from here on out, every time you go to shave for the rest of your life, you will see the scar on your head and think of Kevin Sullivan. Now, this is what gets interesting. Kevin Sullivan, a changed man, but so is the champion here, Bob Roop, because the heel Roop no longer playing games no longer faking injuries, hiding behind a mask, no longer running. He doesn't want to break Sullivan's bones. He wants to break his heart. Warp his mind, you said, Bob. I wrote, wow, 
That's deep shit. Roop wants a match to end this thing once and for all. To see this, this clip of this matchup is actually out there, and I put it on my YouTube. You guys just going at it. You, the pull-apart brawl, it was a wild sight, and by all accounts, you can hear it right there on the video, the crowd going nuts as you guys just want at each other. Well, I, I wish I had. I hadn't seen. I didn't look at that. I looked at some, I told you earlier in private. Mm -hmm. I looked at some today. I looked at the one where I gave his father the shoulder breaker, and I yes. agree with you. The way I had to give it to him, I, I couldn't get my arm around him, my right arm. So I had to keep my right arm in, like, between his legs and hold him with my left arm. And it looked like I, it looked like I broke his, <laughs> it really did break his shoulder. Right. But again, again, I didn't. I, I was able, he, he wasn't that big, you know. I mean, he was less than 200 pounds. I was able to hold him, you know, and just kind of gently put him down. Uh -huh. That was some heady stuff. And, you know, I, I remember the interview now because of the fact that I remember the part every time I look in the mirror. Uh, yeah, that was an effective interview. And, you know, we come across we came across as serious, you know, like dead serious. And the people out there, not to not to put down any like Ray Stevens, my God, you can't put him down or Pat Patterson, both of them geniuses. But after 10 years, five years, two years, I don't care how mad you get in an interview. I mean, you can't. There's only so many ways you get mad. Right. We've seen it before. I mean, yeah, they've seen it before, and you get in a law of diminishing returns. So with us, you know, we were fresh. They were seeing this for the first time, and they had no background on any of us at all, on, you know, where we came from and who we were and the fact that we had our credentials out there in the ring. I mean, the matches, what I've seen, I see lack of experience compared to, like, later on in my career for both of us. But as far as the work itself, there weren't any big gaffes or mistakes or exposés in our work. It was it was it was seriously believable. Yeah, and the ideas, all those ideas, I'm not sure where all of them came from, but it doesn't matter if we were a brain trust, uh, whatever it was, it was working. And uh, you know, again, I had the wherewithal to be able to you know put it out there. So I'm always a producer. A producer hires a director and you know, all kinds of people, a photographer and all those different things to film the show, whatever he's producing. But he's the one that makes it happen. He produces it. So that's what I was doing, as well as some directing and, you know, that sort of thing. And then being an actor and, of course, myself. But, you know, that was that was the behind the scenes role that I played. That, uh, And the only reason I mention it is not like a big pat on the back. But Kevin could give me his ideas about our angle, and then he could watch TV take a nap. Uh, Dean could call me or talk to me about, and then he could go on. Alexa like Schmidt off could give me his ideas, whatever, and then he could go and have a beer. I had to take all that stuff and figure out how to place it, you know, where, how, what, what order to place it in, what to stress, what not to stress. Should this be red hot? Should this be uh, lukewarm? Uh, and I had to put all that together. So while other guys got a chance to participate on a small time, you know, or a partial basis, I had the respons a responsibility of putting it all together to make it work. Uh, and, you know, I didn't always do the, you know, the best job in the world. I mean, nobody's perfect. But, you know, we did we did well. The only reason I keep talking about being able to put it together, because it took a lot of extra work that the rest of the guys didn't have to do. And that's what I give myself credit for is putting in those extra hours because I go to bed thinking about wrestling and wake up thinking about I me mean, and not wrestling about our show and what we were going to do. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you uh, like the intensity. Those I look at my interviews from those days and they were intense. You know, they were dead serious. I believe me. And uh, <laughs> I, I thought, well, Bob, you act like you really were bad. But, you know, I don't think. Kevin potato me that bad, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was good stuff. And the fans out there, I don't know if I told you the one about a fan coming up to me in the back in the tunnel in the back where we dress. I was out there for some reason by myself, or maybe I was getting ready to leave. And this guy came out and he said, uh, "But you know, I was a heel, of course." This guy says, "Hey, Bob, we really like the shit you guys are doing now." That's exactly what he said. <laughs> Pardon my language, folks, but. We like the shit you're doing now. <laughs> well, 
Well, it's a compliment, you know. I mean, he said the shit like he's not saying we don't. We like the great show you're doing now. <laughs> right, right. Saying. Well, you he, can't break kayfabe, like, so you're a heel, yeah. and you don't want to sell that it's just you know doing <laughs> shit out there. But at the same time, that's got to make you feel good a little bit in, inside. Like, man, I know we're doing all right. <laughs> well, it was a guy that looked about forty five. He obviously was intelligent. He was sure. You know, he was congenial. He was complimentary. So I said, well, I'm glad you do. You know, keep coming. Uh, I mean, he was telling me he was smart to the business. Right. right. You know, he was saying, <laughs> you know, oh, you guys are really bad at each other, aren't you? No. Right, you know, right. We, we like that shit you're doing. So, yeah, that's the best compliment you can get. Somebody saying, hey, I know it's not real. And I'm still coming. For fans, that's the best you can get. It's supposed to work. You know, at the time, we were still before... Uh, the promoters, not right. me, ladies and gentlemen, not me, but before the promoters, Vince McMahon and Roy Shire exposed the business for being a sports competition, entertainment. Yeah, sports entertainment. entertainment. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I was. I wasn't the first. At least if I was, it had, didn't come out until about twenty-five years after those guys. A lot longer than that, but uh, so I love the fact that a lot of this video footage actually exists because you see, you hear so many stories. From so many uh, old, I don't want to call them old timers, Bob, legends, really, uh, that, that talk about, oh, we had the house packed or the crowd was going nuts. And a lot of times, you know, they tell some stories. Everybody has a fishtail, right? But right. I love that the video is here. So when we say this happened, you can simply go to YouTube and see that, no, this happened. There were over 12,000 fans in that arena. They were rocking. And this was huge. You guys doing the pull apart, the locker room emptying to pull you guys apart. And of course, from there in the kayfabe world, promoter Roy Shire sees the issues boiling over. He heard the cries of both you and Kevin Sullivan, and a death match is then booked for the next Cow Palace card in November. No disqualification, no stopping for blood, falls do not count. Much like a Texas death match, it's the last man standing who will be determined the winner. We're now four months into this feud and fans waiting for that next match. Wow. And if there wasn't already enough to draw a hell of a house next time around with that death match, you guys continue to add pieces to this story in the interim. The next piece being a young man we touched on a few weeks ago by the name of Barry Orton. Barry O. So Orton comes in working underneath as a babyface for a couple of months. Then on November 5th TV, Barry teams with Kevin Sullivan versus the duo of Kurt and Carl Von Steiger. And during the matchup, Orton winds up turning on partner Sullivan, attacking him, and delivering a pile driver, laying Kevin out. Are you guys confused out there? Well, you won't be for long, as Bob Roop makes his way out for an interview after the matchup, explaining that Barry O had been working undercover, if you will, as sort of a, a bounty hunter for Bob Roop here, earning $5,000 for his attack here today on Kevin Sullivan. Orton was just waiting for that right moment to soften Kevin up, before that big death match between Kevin and Roop, what a cerebral move there, Bob. Dastardly. And make no mistake about it, that match will indeed still go down, still take place November the 12th, the death match I'm talking about, as Kevin returns later in the same program after taking that pile driver, Sullivan now rocking a neck brace. He admits that Roop and Orton, they got one over on him. They got him earlier. They hurt Kevin, but they didn't finish the job. And that's where you made the mistake, Bob. Kevin states that he won't make the same mistake in the death match because he can't be disqualified. He will do anything he wants to Bob Roop, and he wants to hear Bob beg for mercy. He wants to hear Bob apologize for everything he did to Kevin's brother John and his father George. But even then, that still won't be enough to keep Kevin from ending you. I wrote, wow, great promos leading into this. That's what sold the house back then. We're missing these kind of promos today. Just absolutely master stuff here from both ends. And all this attack did was give Kevin yet another reason for revenge. More motivation, indeed. Boy, the booker for that territory must have been a genius. My God, that's some good stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's, not like this, it's not like you already don't have a five-star cake in front of you for, for every sellout at the, here or near sellout at the Cow Palace. But you guys have to add some sort of a layer to it every time. It's amazing how much is added in here. No wonder you guys were packing them in. Yeah, it was a, it was a really heady time. Uh, you know, this stuff, back to what you said a minute ago, you said that we, 
were shooting from the shoulder. We were leveling with people. Like, like you say, every wrestler, when he tells a story, it's always a sellout. I mean, the show was always a sellout in every story. And we, we talked about not only was it not a sellout, you gave direct numbers, 4,300 uh, for a couple of shows in a yeah. row and, and then move, you know, up the Quickly car. Quickly jumped to 12,000, yeah. Yeah, and I talked about going down the aisle and the last four or five rows of seats and the downstairs on the floor were empty. I mean, we're not saying, you know, we're not trying to create any false, you know, narrative here. It is what it is. And in fact, you can't, what difference would it make? If it was a sellout, well, what was the next show? Was that also a sellout? Because, see, that's what happens. Sometimes you can have a sellout. When we get to Australia, Jim Barnett, with the Fullers, <laughs> I'll tell you about that one. Sure. But, um, again, it was good times. It was a way to use Barry. Uh, he was, I mean, it was. you talk about getting him over uh, as a heel, uh, it was perfect. And I, I didn't originally bring him in that way, but it, it, this, it worked out. It was just perfect. Now, Shire, getting him to go along with this stuff was difficult sometimes because he wanted to figure out some way to try to take credit for it. And, you know, I said, I don't care, Roy. You can tell everybody you did it. I don't care. But, you know, as long as it's what we do. And so I, I saw that one thing I did see and was not astonished, but when he came out there to tell Kevin that he was being fined and all that kind of thing, you know, he he looked like a sane, reasonable, you know, uh, right, human being. He yeah. looked like the, <laughs> you know, I never saw him that calm. You know, every time I saw him, first thing he said is he he's got a problem. He's got something he wanted to bitch about. The other thing in in avoiding Roy, I you know I couldn't at TV. He was there at every TV. If he said he wanted to see me, there's no way I could say no. I had to go see him. But I I started out right away. When he would call me into the office to talk to me, I would delay until there was oh, like 15 minutes left before showtime. And then I would dash in there. And the first time I went in, like the first week after I'd left him in, in, in San Francisco instead of carrying him to Fresno. Now it's the next week at TV. He calls me in there and he starts out. And I cussed me, but gee, do you, you know, this, that, blah, blah. I said, wait a minute. I said, first of all, let's get something. I need to sell something with you. I worked out here four or five years ago, going through on my way to Japan, and you told me you were going to pay me, of course. And, you know, I never got paid. And he looked, he stopped, he shut up, he looked at me, <laughs> I'm talking about money now. And uh, I said, yeah, you owe me, boy, it was 25 bucks, right? I said, you owe me that money. And uh, he said, well, I, I, Bob, I, I said, you know, before you completely deny that, let me add up. Over the years, in the dressing room, talking to other boys, I've also found out other guys got stuff like that, too. So maybe you make a habit out of it. He said, well, I got people that do that that for me. I said, you got people that pay everybody? I said, you don't make the payoffs? Oh, no, I make the payoffs. I said, well, what do these other people do for you? Well, they write the checks. I said, and you sign them, right? He said, well, yeah, guy, yeah, I sign them. So I said, well, do you keep track of what's in your, your, your accounts? Well, you're not damn right. I keep, I keep track of what's in the accounts. Of course I do. I said, well, have you ever noticed a discrepancy in your accounts? Not having enough money? He said, no, never. I said, well, having too much? Well, well no. I said, well, well there's somebody stealing from you, right? Because uh, you wrote me a check, and I didn't cash it. Then that $25 should be in your account. And if all the other guys that you wrote checks didn't cash theirs because they didn't get them, then that money should also be in your account. So if that money's not in your account, the people, those people you say they're looking out for your interest, they've been stealing money from you. But all I know, Roy, is that you've been on this this money, and he kept trying to interrupt. Well, wait, well, I know. Well, let's talk. We got. I said I've been waiting four or five years to talk to you about this. You can't wait a few minutes to talk about the TV. So finally, we got down to about three or four minutes. I said, well. Bob, I said, well, don't worry about the, the television. Why well, I said, it's taken care of. Well, what do you mean it's taken care of? I said, I'm taking care of it. I'm the booker. I already told this part. Right. I said, I'm the booker. The booker takes care of the TV. It's taken care of. Now, you want to change that and make it different. I said, you know, be my guest. Yeah. You can go out there and tell them what you want them to do. But I've already told them what I want them to do. I mean, you got anything else? And I just left. Right. Well, I did that for like three weeks. 
you know, I knew he was never going to give me a nickel. But I come back in and he I said, by the way, where's my check? Or, you know, you want to pay me in cash? Uh, no. I said, no, why? And so I kept bugging him with that. I had a lot of fun with it myself. Uh, but it was a way to keep him distracted. Think sure. of it, 25 bucks. I was able to keep a millionaire from basically <laughs> having his way with what do you want to talk about? I think well, that's where that and Pat McGinnis kept him away at different times. Anyway. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so here we are. Away we go. November twelfth, the Cow Palace, the re 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 match, if you will, the death match. As the war rages on, you guys both enter this thing like caged animals released into a fight pit. You guys want at each other. You beat each other senseless, bloody, battered, exhausted. Your legs wobbly. And the realism told here by all accounts from the fans that were in attendance made this feel as real as real could get the way you guys were selling. And while there would be no stopping for blood, no time limit, no disqualification for anything you did with your own two hands, you have to remember foreign objects were technically still barred from being used here in this matchup. So naturally that meant that the heel Bob Roop would find a way to sneak one in and use it. And of course you do. Bob Roop laying Sullivan out cold, knocking him out with, it looked like maybe a, a pair of knuckle dusters there, scoring a pinfall here. Of course, pinfalls don't count, but the referee can begin that 10 count as Bob Roop scores that pinfall in the third fall of the matchup, but Sullivan somehow able to beat the count back to his feet, and the matchup continued. From there, the referee gets a bump, takes a bump and falls to the outside onto the floor, which made this a perfect time for Roop to go back into his trunks once again and pull out that foreign object to use a second time in the match. But this time, Kevin intercepts the weapon, takes it from Roop, and uses it himself to knock Bob into next week. Out goes the U.S. champion Bob Roop down and out on the mat, but Sullivan wasn't done yet, delivering the pile driver to Bob Roop from there, the very move that Barry Orton had used on Sullivan when he turned on him back on TV. An added message there, and I love the constant storytelling here. So after blasting you with the brass knucks, after landing that pile driver, it appeared as if Kevin had the upper hand at that point. But after delivering the pile driver, Sullivan too collapsed to the mat after the war that had already transpired throughout the past 20, 30 minutes. And at that point, with the ref down and out on the floor, a second official entered the ring and began to count to 10 on both men, both men down on the mat. As Roop lay unconscious, though, Kevin began to stir, began grabbing the ropes, pulling himself up midway through the referee's count, Sullivan using those ropes to stabilize himself on his feet, beating the 10 count. Meanwhile, Bob Roop still laying there, trying to muster enough energy to even sit up. And if it ended there, it would have been an amazing storybook ending. But, well, it just wouldn't be the Roop-Sullivan feud if it ended there, now would it? So at that point, it seemed as though Sullivan had finally exacted revenge. The referee reaches 10. Bob Roop unable to get to his feet. Sullivan beats the count. It appears Kevin Sullivan has scored the win, both for himself and his family. And the icing on the cake, he is the brand new United States champion. However, the following TV, after reviewing the film, we would learn that because both men had used a foreign object during the matchup, the U.S. title was being vacated, held up, pending yet another rematch. But where do you go from here, Bob? Where do you go after a death match? Well, the only place you can go, inside a steel cage, in the war to settle the score, the brawl to end it all, the final countdown to the blow-off match, the match that was set to settle things once and for all. And to make sure the referee wouldn't go down this time, a special call was made to the 601-pound country boy from Morgan Corners, Arkansas, Haystacks Calhoun appointed the special guest referee for the big cage match. Wow. Um, how'd it go? <laughs> well, we will get there. Well, here we go, guys. It's the final match, the final showdown, December 3rd, 1977 in the Cow Palace, drawing yet another 12,000-plus fans for this epic encounter the vacant U.S. title on the line inside a steel cage. Without coming right out and saying it, there was a feeling in the air that this was the night the feud would finally be settled once and for all. 
And Bob, as a heel, you try a little bit of everything here in this match, from trying to flee over the top of the cage to your good buddy Alexis Smirnoff coming ringside and handing you off a pair of brass knuckles. Could it be, was Bob Roop going to steal the win and win this war? But Sullivan, he sees it coming, snatches the brass knuckles away, and Kevin then cocks back and blasts Bob Roop with those knuckle dusters, knocking Bob out cold once again here in the month of December. And the crowd explodes. The roof nearly ripped off the cow palace. Sullivan had the match, the revenge, and the title in the palm of his hand. But as Sullivan drops down to cover you, Bob, Haystacks Calhoun calls for the bell. Calhoun apparently disqualifying Sullivan for blatantly using an illegal foreign object in this cage match. So it appears that Bob Roop regains the vacant U.S. title on a disqualification in what should be the blow-off of a six-month-long feud. This was Sullivan's final chance to exact revenge. After months of being one-upped by the cerebral heel, Bob Roop, Kevin had the support of 12,000-plus in the palace and thousands more sitting at home waiting for the next TV to hear the good news. Only, there was no good news. Not for the fans, not for Kevin, and pretty soon, not for you either, Bob but we'll get to that shortly. But going back to an interview I found on YouTube, Kevin Sullivan, in regards to this blow-off matchup, Sullivan had stated that this was not your booking, Bob, nor his idea, but rather Roy Shire getting his hands on the book and insisting on this particular finish here. Kevin actually cites this as the reason he gave notice to the territory, because he leaves right around the time you do. Kevin actually went so far as to refer to this angle as the stupidest finish he was ever involved with. Sullivan went on to say he knew his heat was killed dead, stating that he was buried coming out of that finish, and he said based on the crowd response, they knew they got screwed as well. So Roy Shire, after months of this, according to Kevin Sullivan, he comes in and says, this is the way we're going to do it, boys, and maybe it's because the whistle had already been blown, you know what I'm talking about, I don't really know, but it's, uh, Sullivan says, he recounts that Shire came in, whatever you guys had initially planned, he kiboshed that and said, this is what we're doing, a disqualification on the baby face. That couldn't have done well for Haystacks either moving forward, but it, literally, I could see that killing Sullivan's heat dead, uh, his momentum just completely done. Yeah. And yeah. I just, I, I, I can't believe after months and months of Sullivan chasing you, looking for revenge, the finish is he doesn't get it. I just, I don't understand that. Well, it's, it's of course, it's, uh, it's idiocy if you think about it, because... Even if I was going to be leaving because uh, I had been found out about the, the possible hostile takeover, then before I left, if Shire had asked me to put Kevin over, I would have done it, you know, because for Kevin's sake, I mean, he, we'd made some money together. And even if I was gone, uh, there was no need for him to go too. Uh, you know, I was willing to take the heat and, I mean, it was I was the one that went to all these guys with the, with the news about the, a possibility. So right. uh, I would take the responsibility for it, and I'd be gone. Uh, but he he could stay there and make some money and make everybody else some money. So they should have had him beat me right in the middle. I have no idea. Again, I was never real impressed with uh, with Shire's uh, you know his mentality about the wrestling business. The shows I saw him run, I thought were terrible. And again. There were no, uh, there were very few fans there, and the ones that were there knew what was going to happen. So, I mean, again, being predictable in pro wrestling is uh, death that's ticket sales, and uh, it's horrible for uh, the wrestlers because the fans that are there come to hoot at them. They come just to laugh at them and make fun of them and yell boring and uh, figure out ways to try to make them run around. If you yell boring at wrestlers long enough, you can get them to start running around doing crazy stuff right. to try to, to, to get fans to, you know, get with the program. And places like Philadelphia, you never will uh, unless you, you know, you have the psychology to do it. You can run around all day and they'll just keep, they'll laugh, think, well, we've really got these guys running around. <laughs> we'll just keep, we'll just keep doing it. You got to, you got you to gotta act like they're not there in order to get their attention. So. And, you know, I apologize for not being able to talk more about the matches themselves, although you can see them. You know, I mean, you can see what happened, and 
at least some of them, and right. that speaks for itself. It's not just that it's been, uh, what, 45, 50 years? It's not just that. It's just that the matches that went well, I don't remember them. Because you do, I mean, when, you, when you've gotten 5,000 headlocks on people, I mean, how can you remember a specific <laughs> one? Right, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just like... It, it Boy, lost, the way we did it, that headlock into the head scissors last week, that's the one I'm going to remember forever. Yeah. yeah, unless the guy's head comes off, or maybe he's got a toupee and that <laughs> there comes you go. off. There you go. You know, that would be different. But, you know, and then I'd remember something like that. But again, and not just that, I've watched, I, because I was a booker in these territories, I watched all the matches. So not just my own match, but watching all these other matches, I saw so much stuff. It's hard for me to remember every every detail right. of the matches I had. If they went well, I don't even remember working with Pat Patterson, and uh, I told that one before. And who would thank you for you could forget about working with Pat? But the match went so well, there was nothing to remember about sure. it really. And I wasn't a mark to say, "Oh, I'm a big stud. I'm a pro because I work with so and so." I will ameliorate that, or I'll, I'll, I'll add a codicil to that. That I'll say another day. I'm still hot about. We'll get to this with Shire, but he him uh, getting me suspended by the California Athletic yeah, Commission. We, we definitely have that on and, tap. And not being able to work with Andre in yeah. a single match at the Forum. Imagine that. My first match at the LA Forum was Andre the Giant. Well, I think that would have been I the mean, Olympic, the Olympic Auditorium. Yeah, you're right. I I don't I'm not good with with places. So uh, that would have put me up there with anybody in the business, sure, you know, sure. as far as being a main 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 event guy and a headliner. And I was fairly still fairly young in the business. You know, it takes ten years to learn the business. I'd only been in it about eight. So you know, to have done the gone that far that fast uh, would have been a, you know a real something I could still talk about, tell my grandkids about. You know, I worked on a single match with Andre That's the Giant. Right, right, yeah. I, I love the revisiting you guys did throughout this entire thing. It sucks to see that's the way it ended. It was neither your nor Kevin's fault. You know, unfortunately, you guys were just a victim of circumstance there. But, and the fans were a victim as well because, I mean, they followed this thing. They were paying for the tickets every month, waiting to see Kevin get that one, two, three. And it, it was never meant to be because Roy Shire comes in after seeing what you guys had done and just, to me, ruins the whole thing as a fan. But the consistency – in the storytelling throughout, you didn't verbally explain everything to the fans. You didn't insult their intelligence. Why did Kevin Sullivan use the shoulder breaker on you? Why did Sullivan pile drive you after Barry Orton had pile driven him? Why the foreign object was back again in December? You let the fans soak it in for those ah moments. So you're telling stories yeah. visually and letting the fans put it together. I love that. Well, I thank you for that, Ray. And uh, yeah, and another thing, I'm as a professional, uh, I'm proud of the fact that we gave people their money's worth. We were we went out there. We didn't do three minute, four minute, five minute matches. I mean, I don't want to knock anybody, but you know, Dusty Rhodes. Uh, I guess I'll knock him. Uh, now he might have been <laughs> able to. He, well, what you could say in defend of Big Dust is that maybe in four minutes he was able to give fans what it took me twenty minutes to give, because he doing telling a story. Uh, almost every match with Dusty was like a blow off. You know, by the time they got in the ring with somebody. There was already enough heat between them that he could start his comeback from the tie-up. Steve Kern and I got to that situation. That's a great place to be because you're at the final chapter and the rest of the book was already read before you got in the ring. And that's right. nice. Instead of having to start out at uh, uh, you know chapter one and build up to that final chapter, that's great to, so that Dusty could do that. It actually is a tribute to him. But – I don't think if the fans in California would have liked it if Kevin and I went out there and did an average of like six, seven minutes in those main events instead of 20, 25, 30, whatever we did. And, you know, we weren't laying around in holes either. Uh, we did get some holes, and, you know, you punish them, and you do things like I'd have a hole in Kevin, I'd use the ropes or something to try to, uh, you know, get extra leverage to try to make him give up and, you know, to build my heat that way. And But we gave them action. And both of us were fit. We were both hungry. We were, you know, just starting to feel our oats and getting a chance to achieve it. I mean, it was a freak thing that it happened that that blew up going back to earlier programs where Shire and Pat Patterson having a having a fallout falling out because of of the automobile, you know, the motorcycle uh, accident. You know, right. Roy almost killing that poor guy on the motorcycle. Yeah. 
Then having a fallout opened the door for me to get in there. It's just one of those moments of time and being in the right place at the right time that we got the opportunity to do that. Well, the fact that I had enough experience yeah. as being an assistant booker to write right. three. You had that in your three, back pocket. But three very good guys. Not just that, but Eddie Graham. Eddie Graham on Tuesday night would come to the matches, at least my first several years he did, and he would give finishes to some of the matches. And just, I would always watch it. You know, he'd act out, he'd work. He would act like he's just coming up with it just that second. He already had in mind what he wanted to do, but I mean, he wouldn't talk about, hey, you hit him with a backdrop and pen him. He would say, hey, he'd give like four or five false finishes. You know, he'd build it up and like, he would be acting out, he'd almost tell you the timing, and then you wait a couple of seconds and you recover a little bit. And then you, well, I watched him doing all that. Well, now, that was just at the Tampa matches. The people, the bookers in the office had Eddie Graham there conceivably, I mean, possibly all day, every day, to pick that mind. So when I was working with them, even if Eddie wasn't there, maybe his input was going into something that the bookers and I were talking about. So the only reason I'm saying that is it'd be like if you're in politics, it'd be like having Henry Kissinger as part of a seminar that the guys that you're dealing with, your your professors, went and, and had a seminar with Henry before they came back to give you their their right. new outlook. So by having that, you know, out there as a booker, I had all these great ideas and nuances and timing and all these things, just waiting for a place to use them. And again, having given Kevin credit, Kevin Kevin in this situation starting out on top with us uh, as we go as we go down into the future, maybe it doesn't stay that way, but for the moment, you know, I looked at the interviews that Kevin was making. He was fresh-faced and young, and, you know, his uh, youthful exuberance was there, and, you know, he was hungry, and he was, you know, really vibrant. He was very good. You know, his interviews were very sincere, you know. I mean, he, he came across, I liked him much better as a babyface than as the devil, the press of darkness, but that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, yeah, I, those were heady days. I like my interviews, too. Uh, I was able to come across as just this real jerk, uh, but with some credibility. I mean, you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't the crybaby cannon guy I talked about, you know. Right. Like, but at the right time, yeah, I mean, but, you know, I'm going to back up. Now, if in real life, some guy came up to me at the grocery store and said, you know, I'm an old wrestling fan. When I was at the Masters 40 years ago, on one of your Masters, my son got crippled, and I'm here to make up for it. Well, I'd be pretty alarmed. <laughs> I'd be pretty alarmed now. At right. The grocery store. Sure. So back then, with being able to come in with Kevin and say that, yeah, you crippled my little brother, uh, you know, that's good stuff. You know, that's a good, that's a nice way to create a an instant angle. And he ran with it. You know, well, he came up with it. He even produced his own father. I mean, <laughs> what more can you ask from a guy? No, yeah. I think I would have liked to get a picture of mom, see what she looked like if. She was really attractive. Maybe I could have done something with her, too. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't mean anything on tour, but, you know, like... Just having some fun, man. It was it was a hell of a, a few just from beginning to end, like a half a year, six months here, and it, you guys just kept selling out. It never waned off once you got going. It was just an amazing time, but as all good feuds do, they come to an end. Whether we like the finish of that last match or not, don't blame Bob. Don't blame Kevin there. Blame Roy Shire. Speaking of Roy Shire, uh, Bob, now it's time for the rest of the story here this week. As we get into the demise of your working relationship with the promoter himself, Roy Shire. And this is where we correct the false narrative that's been floating around for nearly a half century now. If people like factual accounts of historical events, this is something you won't want to miss. But before we talk about the promoter Roy Shire, this is an excellent time to discuss a fellow co-promoter in the San Francisco territory, and I'm talking about a guy by the name of Louis Miller. In fact, uh, wrestling historian Phil Lyons described Miller as a promoter. He said, Louis Miller was one of the longest-running pro wrestling promoters in history, having promoted shows in a span of 49 years in over 20 different towns across California, booking the likes of NWA world champions and megastars like Jim Londos, Gus Sonnenberg, Luthez, Buddy Rogers, Gorgeous George, Antonino Rocca, Andre the Giant, the Grams, Ray Stevens, and many more. Now, the man who wrote that, Bob, Phil Lyons, had inquired, and I wanted to ask you myself as well, if you could maybe share a good Louis Miller story 
Do you have a good story or can you at least describe Miller the man? Without getting into the story we're about to jump into, without telling, talking about any of that yet, can you give the people out there an idea of who Louis Miller was? Because his name isn't talked about a whole lot. Well, unfortunately, I can't give you a lot of detail. Louis didn't come around a lot. I mean, he was at the, at the shows. He promoted Sacramento, right? Yeah, Sacramento and a few of the other towns as well, yeah. Yeah, he. Uh, but he was a good guy. I mean, he was a nice man. And I don't know if Roy Kent went to Sacramento or not. Probably not. I don't remember. But whenever he was around, I know that Louis didn't come to the TV. Uh, in Sacramento. We made a TV in Sacramento. He didn't come there because he wanted beer. He didn't like being around Roy. And I can't say I blame him. But he had a good reputation. And he had been there before Roy took over the promotion. And so, you know, he, he knew he had history in the area. And uh, he might have been there for two or three different promoters, for all I know, if he goes back 49 years. Although in 1977, I don't know how many years uh, he'd have been there, maybe. But I know he'd been there longer than Shire, I'm pretty sure. Since the 1930s, I believe. He started. Oh, promoting. well, then, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. He'd been there. For, he'd seen it from his infancy there, probably, mm-hmm. pro wrestling. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure it had to. I sure had to grind him, you know, to see Roy. I don't know. I have no idea what kind of uh, financial relationship Roy had with those guys, with the promoters, the local promoters. But I just know that they, were, you know, we'll get into it. But I know that they were really, really unhappy with him. Here's an. Here's a reason why. Here's a possible reason why. You know, this is all speculation. But if Roy was underreporting box office gate receipts and getting away with it. And the local promoter, his percentage of what he got paid was based on those gate receipts. Then if the total real house was saved $10,000 and and the promoter was supposed to get 10%, then he would get $1,000. If Roy uh, reported the house at 7,500, then he was only gonna get $750. And I talked about another promotion, the promoter Underreported box office receipts with my percentage being included in what got you know got shorted. Uh, so that would give those guys, those local promoters, every reason in the world to you know despise Roy and resent him for thinking you know you can say hey you can steal from you can steal from the government you know you can steal from the athletic commission you can steal from the tax man you can steal from the buildings and all that, but don't steal from us. Right. We're in all this. We're in this together. You know, we're, you know, I, I'm doing, I'm doing a local promotion for you. I'm getting the ad in the paper, making sure the TV runs and, you know, making sure that everything's right with the building and, you know, making sure there's no uh, conflicting things going on that we need to know about. And, uh, you know, I'm doing all the things at local promotion. And plus Roy, if you're Louis Miller, plus Roy Shire, I was doing this while you were still learning to lace up your boots. That's, uh, that's, I'm glad you mentioned all of that as a local promoter, what they have to do, because there's probably a lot of people out there right now saying, wait a minute, I thought Roy Shire was the promoter of the San Francisco territory. Well, just like most territories, there was more than actually, there's one big time promoter, right? The guy on top, but there was guys running a lot of the local towns, the spot shows and things like that. Over in the WWWF and senior, you had Phil Zacco, Arnold Scullin, Gorilla Monsoon. Down in Georgia, Barnett and the boys, they had Fred Ward, Paul Jones, Charlie Harbin. Here in San Francisco, Louis Miller was one of the additional promoters in the other towns outside of that main city of San Francisco. Right. Well, I mean, say you have a, you're the promoter, you're handling every, everything yourself. Sacramento calls, you know, there's been a strike uh, and there's no building employees because the, the custodians went on strike and the building's not going to be available. And then as you get, you hang up and say, okay, I'll be over there, you know, blah, blah, blah. Before you can leave, there, you get another call from uh, Modesto or from, say, uh, Fresno. Uh, yeah, the, the local uh, television station uh, said they didn't get the tape, didn't get the TV tape. Uh, what are you going to do about that? So one person can't handle all that. You got to have local promoters. And I mentioned, I want to redress something right now. I talked about Don and Dottie Curtis in Florida and how I became good friends with them. Don was a promoter in Jacksonville. So when I went to Jacksonville and worked there and I stayed with him afterwards, that's why, you know, he would be at the Masters, of course. He was a local promoter. Uh, but that's why I stayed with him and Dottie. And, and he liked being over there because he was away from the snake pit over there in Tampa. Jacksonville's a couple hundred miles away. So right. he and Dottie were over there in like a normal world. 
instead of being around in Tampa, oh my God, Snake Pit wasn't just in that building, it extended <laughs> everywhere. But yeah, you needed people like Louie, and uh, I don't know the names, I've forgotten the names of a lot of the, uh, there was a guy in San Jose, I can't think of his name, and I don't know who did Fresno. You know, these local, you didn't see them all. Well, you know, a lot of times you don't see the local guy, because, you know, he's, he doesn't need to come in the dressing room. He's right. in the box office. He's, that's where he's at. He's in the box office. Or buy it, make sure nobody's double selling tickets. You know, uh, they did a. They did a. I'm not sure it was a book or a program or whatever. There was like 150 different ways you can steal money in a box office. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, one thing after another, that people working in the box office could steal money and get away with it. So yeah, if I the first job I ever had for championship wrestling for Florida was going down and watching the box office. Right, at, uh, you mentioned that, because nobody knew yeah, who you were yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah, if I'm the promo local promoter, that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be at least cruising by a very, very well, uh, regular basis to check out that box I, office. I thought it was necessary to kind of give everybody an idea of who Louis Miller was, because he's going to play a prominent part in the rest of this story here. And this is where it all starts, Bob, your fallout with the San Francisco Territory and Roy Shire. Enter Louis Miller. For many years, Roy's co-promoter in Sacramento, as well as other, as well as Stockton and uh, various other towns as well, Louis had been with Roy essentially from Shire's inception as a promoter after Roy, listen to this, guys, began holding cards at the Cow Palace. Miller was the first of the Northern California promoters to defect from charter member of the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame Mr. Joe Malkowitz, guys, and align himself with Roy Shire. I wrote, wait, hmm. So co-promoters defecting promoters like Malkowitz to join a new Roy Shire territory? Apparently that was cool back then when Roy did it, I guess. Well, Roy might have given him more money. And maybe, you know, or maybe there was, uh, Louis was having trouble with Malkowitz. I don't know. I have no clue. I don't even, I've never well, I met just, Malkowitz. I, I found it funny. Because, you know, we're going to, well, we'll get into it in just a little bit here. But basically, Malkowitz, for those who don't know, was the original promoter in the San Francisco territory of the NWA. And Well, listen here. He started promoting in San Francisco, Malkowitz did, back in 1935 after sustaining a severe knee injury. So the NWA San Francisco wrestler, Professor Roy Shire, decided to move into promoting in direct competition against Malkowitz, sound familiar, defying the territorial boundaries decreed by the NWA. And in October of 1960, Roy Shire registered the Pacific Coast Athletic Corporation, a.k.a. his promotion here. And he begins to run opposition to Malkowitz, who objected this with the NWA. Shire, though, prevailed in the short-term territorial battle with his roster, built around the flamboyant aerial performer Ray the Crippler Stevens, proving more popular than the uh, reportedly slower-moving heavyweights that Malkowitz was using at the time. And thus, less than a year later, Malkowitz folded his version of the NWA in San Francisco by 1961. And by 1962, Joe had passed away from a heart attack. Now, by all accounts, even though Miller and Shire had made tons of money working together here over the last couple decades, Roy was not an easy person to tolerate. And I see a common denominator here in every story I uncover in regards to Shire as far as the human being goes. In fact, Victor Berry, who ran the programs and has a hell of a photo collection as well from the territory, he stated that Louis was a nice man, although he and Roy never got along. So basically saying exactly what you did, Bob, Roy Shire and Louis Miller did not get along. They never really hung out together, not even at the, uh, the buildings. So Roy and Miller's working relationship became even more strained just a year before you arrived. Louis announced that he had secured business licenses and rental agreements for the Veterans Memorial Auditorium in Santa Rosa. And there had been like three years without wrestling in Santa Rosa, so he was taking a gamble. He said, let's get back in there and draw a couple thousand people. Acquiring talent from Roy Shire, Miller was scheduled his first Santa Rosa card, guys, in March of 76. The main event, listen to this, Don Morocco and Mr. Saido taking on Pat Patterson and Pedro Morales. Wow. So that was the talent he had to work with right out of the gate, Louis Miller, as he started running Santa Rosa. Now, remember, guys, he had already been promoting Sacramento alongside Shire as well. So the first show in Santa Rosa reportedly sells out, as it should. Hundreds turned away. The second card, reportedly another near sellout. 
But after a few successful shows, this is where it gets good, guys, I promise. Terry Garvin and and Jimmy Garvin also take out a wrestling license in Santa Rosa. They begin promoting there as well. Wait a minute. Running the same town as a current promoter? But I thought only people like Bob Roop did such things, guys. (laughs) Terry Garvin has a negative aura around him. We already know that. But it wasn't for running opposition to long-term promoters. Again, this was okay. When he did it back in 1976, apparently 77, the cutoff point, when that's not okay anymore. Well, either that or people simply never bothered to do their homework on this. I guess I'll go for the latter there. Anywho, Shire stopped lending talent to Louis Miller and started lending the talent to the Garvins. Louis stating he was double-crossed by his longtime business partner. In response, Roy claimed it was Miller who had double-crossed Shire. And so Roy fired him. He said we had a corporation in Sacramento and I gave him a little piece of the action. So Roy basically downplaying Louis Miller as a partner here, a co-promoter in certain towns. He says, I gave him a little piece like it was a favor or something. Wow. Well, I, I see why Louis, um, Louis came to me wanting to uh, run against Roy. He saw that uh, I had control of the talent, most of it. We talked about Pepper, and I'm not sure about Dean, but Anyway, most of the guys were would go along with me, and I think it sounds to me. And now, what you just told me—that's news to me. I didn't know the history. Oh, there's there's it. more. There's more. <clears throat> Wait long before he comes to you. So you're going to hear a whole whole bunch more in regards to. I see. You know, by the time I got doing, I said the same thing you did. Oh, I see why this happened now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, in terms of Roy being treacherous, and his god was money. And if, if, if you know, I I'm sure now. I don't know. If Louis handled Santa, would you say what Santa Rosa? Santa Rosa, he uh, just taken over there in '76. Well, did Roy still? Roy was sending him talent. Was Roy still getting uh, like the head promoter's percentage, or was Louis getting more money by doing Santa Rosa? I don't have that information, but based <clears throat> on everything I was reading, I mean, I don't want to, you know, uh, guess here, but it sounded like you know this was like his own dealing. He was uh, basically running this on his own, kind of taking a, a, a flying leap, if you will, because there hadn't been any wrestling in that town in like three years. So he, by all accounts, it was a gamble walking in. I doubt I doubt Roy Shire loved to gamble very much, at least with his own money. Well, I see another possibility. Now, Louis was still promoting some act Sacramento, right? Yes. Stockton? Yes. So he has Sacramento and Stockton. And a couple other has- towns, too, I believe. Well, think of well, a couple other towns, and now Santa Rosa, which is a big, big enough town that you know you're talking about houses with multiple thousands of dollars. All of a sudden, Louis got the basics for a territory, doesn't it? He's got four or five towns that he can run on different nights. Uh, and if I'm Roy Shire, uh, and I see that possibility, uh, I'm going to be thinking about something like Terry Garvin and Jimmy Garvin and myself especially if there was no love loss between the guys. And I don't know, I don't know how anybody could not, not lose any love if they ever had any for Roy Shire. Roy's the classic case. You know, I'm kicking a, a dead dog here. I'm sorry about that. But Roy was an example of power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Roy had a, a little bailiwick. He had his own little corporation where he was like the boss. I mean, he could get rid of anybody. And without any consequences, there were no rules, there were no charters, there were no licenses uh, that weren't, except they were in his name. Uh, So he could fire anybody, hire anybody, do whatever he wanted. And again, power, unlimited power, uh, any power is is heady. It's very dangerous because it's nice to be, you feel strong, you feel, you know, in control of things. So to have unlimited power, uh, especially when you're, maybe small in intellect. Roy was cunning, but he never imp- imp- impressed me with his intellectual ability. And uh, and I'm not trying to put anybody down, but, you know, Roy's been around the world and all that. You're thinking, you know, just st- street smarts, you learn a bunch of stuff. But, well, it's interesting. You know, I I wish I knew more. Uh, I can t- I can testify. <laughs> you folks out there are going, well, well you wait can- a minute, Ruth. What do you know? You say you don't remember the matches. Now you don't know anything about the background. Well, this well, is, I this is know, what was going I on do, before you even got to the territory. Yeah. So this was a long I, time coming. Right. I do know about the parts that applied to me. I mean, I remember most of right. the stuff. But, right. 
But yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not surprised that Louis came to me then. Uh, and that's what he did. He came to me and said, hey, why don't you uh, get the talent and come in with me and uh, we'll promote. Right. And we've got a whole, whole big part on that. And I'm looking forward <coughs> to getting your firsthand memories of that, uh, of how all that went down. But I really felt this was important to set the stage because if we're going to tell the story, we need to tell it from the beginning, how this all started between Shire and Louis Miller to lead to you being brought into this whole scenario here because it didn't even in there. So Roy Shire, he sees the Garvins coming to Santa Rosa. They're trying to run Louis Miller out of Santa Rosa and Shire decides, well, I'm going to give the Garvins the talent instead, even though I've been promoting with Miller, I got him to defect from Malkowicz over 20 years ago. Now I'm going to, you know, cast him aside, be done with him. And uh, he decides he's going to start booking, loaning out his talent to the Garvins in the town, uh, referring to Miller as too old stating he had no drive to promote the matches, claiming Miller only puts one advertisement in the newspaper, and that's the extent of his promoting each week. The wrestlers, they simply don't like that. They want a promoter who promotes. And all of these comments by Shire, believe it or not, Bob, they proved to be a lie. Because, <laughs> based on research from West Coast historians, both online and within several books I've read, in reality, Louis Miller had run several ads in the Santa Rosa newspaper during the two weeks leading up to each card, and one of them being nearly a full-page ad every week. Louis also went as far as to follow up with the sports department at the newspaper to make sure they received the press releases, repeatedly even offering to take them out to lunch to make sure the results were covered in the paper. So it sounds like Louis was working overtime. Not bad for a 72-year-old guy here heading into 1977, but that's not how Shire told the story. But Miller was also known to be in the habit of having his assistants put up posters, advertising the cards all around town, you know, the deal, the telephone poles, in the storefront right. windows, things like that. I'd say that's right. a lot more than one small ad a week in a newspaper, Roy Shire. Yeah, he was doing uh, he was doing what a professional local promoter does, is, uh, as much advertising, you know, putting up posters on telephone poles is, you know, it takes work. I mean, you got to have someone do it, but it's, it pays off. And the newspaper ads, of course. Now, the part about the, the wrestlers that showers using the wrestlers, the wrestlers don't don't want to have a promoter. It does only does one one ad a week. Yeah, all the wrestlers living in San Francisco or around the San Francisco area were getting a copy of the Santa Rosa newspaper every week, every day to check the ads that Louis Miller was or was not putting <laughs> right, in there. Right, right. The wrestlers didn't know anything about what no. Louis Miller was doing. A wrestler reading yeah. a newspaper? Yeah. Well, it's not <laughs> you know the that. connotations. I mean, you, well, it was a joke. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I but even I, I, I didn't have time to read the paper once I started booking there. But right. uh, in, in easier, in slacker times, I did try to stay up with the local news in Atlanta and places. But uh, Shire... Uh, Using the wrestlers is is hilarious. You had tapes of him talking to his wrestlers, calling them SOBs and dumb bastards right. and all that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, his boys. Yeah, they were they were real happy with being uh, being his his partners. So um, you know, it's just amazing that you know he goes so far as to do all this out of nowhere, out of the blue, it seemingly to a guy that he had been co promoters with for more than two decades. And this is now, so this is Roy Shire, the man who took over, stole the NWA territory from Joe Malkowitz guys and took all of his co-promoters. And then here he turns on one of the co-promoters a couple of decades later, Louis Miller, inviting the Garvins into his working agreement here. And it happens pretty fast here. Within three months time, Louis has to give up his rental agreement in Santa Rosa and the Garvins quickly take over the territory, run him out of business there. So uh, it's very unfortunate. So from March to May, is all Louis Miller got in Santa Rosa before Roy Shire made sure he was done. And if you guys are keeping score, it was okay for Roy Shire to run everybody out of town, but not Bob Roop. Now, I, I know, Bob, you don't probably want me saying that over and over, but I want to make a point of this because the narrative has been there forever. And it, it, this is Roy Shire doing this at this point. He's doing, he did it back in the 50s and he, at the end of the 50s, and he's doing it again here in 1976, 77. So it, it seems like business is business, unless you're Bob Roop. Well, yeah, for Roy it was. I, money was again was his um, was his deity. That's what was the bottom line. And of course, he didn't trust anybody because look at him; he couldn't be trusted. He went opposition to Malkowitz, and I I, I was looking at what he did with with Louis. Was he let Louis take the risk of? 
of getting Santa Rosa running again, right? To see see if it would be be successful. Of course, once it was, that's yeah, that's a good point. Once Bob. it was, yeah. I mean, he let Louis take all the risk, and if it failed, then he could blame Louis, uh, and maybe uh, you know lower his pay in, from Sacramento to make up for it if he lost any money. But if it made money, then he made money, and of course, within a couple months, he took it away from him. Uh, that's typical Shire. Uh, well, that's you know, that's back- master class business, you know, whether you like it or not. I mean, you know, if you're a business yeah. person, I mean, obviously, I'll let you take the risk. And then if I see that there's money to be made there, well, I'll just steal it from you. That's, right. that's a, right. you know, that's how you get to be on the top. That's how you get to be, you know, you know pretty wealthy. Well, I don't know what Louis, Louis had, wasn't born yesterday. I don't know sure. what uh, Shire must have said to him to, to get Louis to even trust him. You know, you, again, you know, if you had contracts. Uh, they wouldn't be worth anything because you're going to have to go to court. And by the time you get a hearing, it's going to be a year. And you got to pay an attorney the whole time. And there's no telling under what basically the contract was made. A lot of times there's some shady area that goes into it, like you're talking about having a monopoly between you, which is illegal. You know, so just the contract on its face is criminal. You can't, you can't and of course, they wouldn't have a contract. Everything was verbal, but I don't know how I don't know how anybody could trust Roy. Maybe I don't. know. Maybe he was different in the beginning. I don't know. I wish I knew somebody who had a record of what he was like. Say when he was still working as a wrestler. Right. Was he was he uh, liked? Was he one of the boys? Was he you know people like him, respect him? I, it'd be interesting to know. I mean, I give I have admiration for him becoming a, a good promoter. I mean, you know, he's making a fortune. In a business where, you know, if you get in there and, you know, you manage to win out, uh, you know, Watts did it out there and, you know, Mid-South and uh, different people, you know, got in and and, uh, were able to make some serious money uh, on something nobody had a, a, it's not like a professional athletic team like football, basketball, or baseball where people have charters. It's open to whoever can get in there and do it. Right. So the guys that do, I take my hat off to them. But again, with Roy, I got no problem with him making the money. Uh, my problems come with my interpersonal relationships with him. Right. Uh, with what the way he interacted with me. Uh, if he'd been, if he'd been Paul Bosch, I would have never. I, 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 every promoter in the world could have come to me and said, "Hey, let's go, let's go opposition against Paul Bosch and take Houston." I would have said no. Because I like Paul Bosch, I respected him. They could have said, "Well, we'll give you ten percent. We'll give you half, whatever." I said, "No. <laughs> you want to you want to buy it out from him or something like that? Right. Let's do that." But no, I'm not going to be a snake and go against him. A guy that's treating me right, you know, someone I respect. Uh, no, I'm not going to do it. I think that's an but, excellent point because I think that's you know I don't think it's very clear that's what drives Louis Miller to do what he winds up doing here. Because even though, you know, Shire, oh, sure. Shire ran Miller out of Santa Rosa, essentially, by May of 76, they still worked together in Sacramento for another year. Can you imagine the strained relationship there? As it appears that it was around May of 77 that Roy finally terminated his co-promoting relationship with Louis in Sacramento without Miller's knowledge, Roy becoming the sole promoter in that city. And after defecting from Malkowitz 15 or so years prior, Miller now left on the side of the road by Shire. His main town taken from him. So Shire is literally taking towns from another promoter all the way here in 1977. And Miller was just supposed to stop promoting there, I guess, according to Shire anyway. Oh, you're done. Just go home. But now in June of 77, Louis reportedly filed a breach of contract suit. Like, like you just mentioned, Bob, things can get held up in court for months, if not years, to even get anything rolling. So it was time for Miller to take a different approach And this is where you take over, Bob. I'm going to let you tell the story of Louis Miller having a conversation with Bob Roop. Yeah, you know, with uh, with Roy uh, just cutting Louis off, that might have been Louis' sole source of income. I mean, that might have been where he was making his money. I mean, I don't know. But if that was his sole source of income, which might be as much as, I don't know, eight, nine hundred bucks a week, uh, then, you know, all of a sudden he's left without a paycheck. You know, that <laughs> Shire wouldn't think anything about doing that. You know, that just you know, that money, that's the money he doesn't have to 
I mean, I talked I talked a while back about Bug and Shire for weeks, a couple of weeks, three weeks in a row, about 25 bucks. If a guy had any sense, he would have pulled 25 bucks out of his pocket and just given it to me and shut me up. And then he could talk about what he wanted to talk about. But he wasn't willing to do that. Remember the board, the fifteen dollar board? You know, he he might have had a stroke over the board breaking because it cost him fifteen bucks, and he wasn't going to get the money back. Well, he wasn't going to give me my money back. So, yeah, if he can have a chance to uh, cheat Louie, or I would say screw him out of out of uh, a paycheck where the money goes in his pocket, yeah. I got a, a little side story before we get on to Louie here about the, about Roy. Now, I heard a story, and I, I don't know if it was made up or not, but it's, even if it was, it's a good one. But my story, but what I heard was that Roy, after he got uh, extremely wealthy, he joined the Millionaires Club in San Francisco. You know, he, he showed his bank account or whatever. He was qualified. He, when he went in the club, uh, they were showing him around, and you know, he went into the special members' lounge, and, the, and they, there was one area in the back where uh, there was a couple of big double doors, and there's a little gate, little one of those little uh, stanchions with a little red rope hanging between them. And he saw somebody go by it, and go in there, and he started going like he was going to go in there. And the, the the guy who was showing around said, "Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shire, uh, that that that's private." And uh, Roy said, uh, "What are you talking about? Uh, you know, I'm in the Big Earns Club. Uh, you know, what are you saying? I can't get a." Oh, well, sir, I'm sorry. That's the billionaire's club. You're not qualified for that one, sir. And so Roy, 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 quit, Roy quit the club because, you know, even now, though he's a multimillionaire, you know, he's, he still hadn't made it to the top yet. The billionaires are, uh, are, are keeping him out of their special place. So, you know, the guy was just never, he was never going to be satisfied. And uh, screwing Louis Miller around wasn't going to do it. Although he might have gotten pleasure out of it, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, Roy was a very unhappy guy, and we know why. But now back to Louis coming to me. I don't remember the particulars. I know that he was always pleasant when we worked in Sac- Sacramento. He was around. I mean, he wasn't following me around or anything, but I'd see him a couple times a night. He'd come say hello or something, and. Uh, he noticed that, you know, I was in charge. You know, Roy wasn't even around most of the time if he was there at all. You know, he, Roy didn't, like I said in earlier programs, Roy didn't want to be around if he couldn't be, you know, the big boss and everybody was saying, oh, where's Roy? And, oh, here he comes. Oh, my God, you know. And if he couldn't do that, he wasn't happy. So uh, he would be off somewhere, you know, maybe uh, figuring out ways to steal money or something. But Louis would come around and, um, you know, he, he was – they're nice. He was convivial, you know, congenial guy. And I liked him. He was respectful. He treated me well. But they noticed that he and other promoters knew, re- recognized in their towns. First of all, that Roy wasn't there, or at least not out front, uh, you know, stomping around a ro- dressing room like a little rooster. Uh, but also that I was the one telling the boys what to do. And also they were noticing that their gay receipts were going up. They were noticing that big time. I think the combination of the two, that I had control of the talent, most of it, at least the main event guys, uh, and Kevin being, you know, the main event babyface, was a big deal. Also, uh, I had the Von Steigers, and Carl Von Steiger and I were friends. Now, Kurt was, I didn't even know Kurt before they got, before he, I came out there and he came in. Well, we'll save, we'll but, save Kurt for a little later in the show. Yeah, but, yeah. but I knew Carl, and Carl and I were were personal friends, and I, you know, I liked him a lot. And so these promoters saw that I had con- not just control of the guys, but you know, the guys seemed to like me and respect me, and vice versa. I liked them and respected them. So you know, they saw they saw something that, and I'm just having a thought that maybe Roy's method of the way he treated the wrestlers had a purpose to it. You know, if he got like Moondog Maine that time when I saw it, when he got him aside, and he cussed him like a dog. Uh, that maybe the other boys that saw that would kind of avoid Lonnie Maine the rest of the night or even the rest of the week. I don't know. Uh, because, you know, maybe out of, of sympathy, they didn't want to embarrass him. You know, I haven't seen him being chewed out, chewed out like a little three-year-old. Uh, but it was a way of keeping the boys. It wasn't going to pull the boys together. 
because the boys, first of all, wrestling is not a buddy pal organization. It's not like football and baseball and basketball. In those team sports, you want your teammates to do the best they can because the better they do, the better your team does. And wrestling is every man for himself or, you know, tag team, say, it's two of you. So you're competing for that top dollar, for that top spot. That way, there's no really close friendships that, are, that come out of pro wrestling because guys are always, and it's not bad. I mean, it's just a fact. Guys are always competing with each other. And unfortunately, some of the ways guys would compete would be to try to stooge up other guys who did something untoward, like maybe they were doing drugs or they maybe, uh, you know, uh, some brand in somebody's car or something and got away with it. Or they go back to the office and stooge them off, like get the guy demoted, and they could take their, they would move up the card, and that was that was there were politics involved, is what I'm saying. So there was there was a lot of that in the business, and so there was Lonnie Main, like if you had a teammate, a guy that you played next to for years, he got chewed out. Afterwards, you might go to him and say, "Hey, man, it's too bad, you know, like that Bob Shire was way out of line, man. I'm sorry about that." But because this guy really is your competition, you're not going to do that. So maybe Roy's, maybe his M.O., with all that yelling and screaming and putting guys down, maybe that was on purpose to kind of keep the boys uh, separated, keep them individuals rather than in a group. But whatever he did, uh, the other promoters saw that it wasn't like that. I wanted all the guys to like each other. If you're working with guys you like and respect in a ring, the matches go better. Uh, you're not worried about a guy trying to get over at your expense to steal right. your heat or the popularity. And, you know, and it makes for a happier dressing room, too. I mean, if you can make your work happy, why would you not do everything you can towards that end instead of like putting everybody against each other? No, that's not at least it wasn't my way of doing things. So, yeah, the promoters saw that and they said, well, you know, if we get, can get root, you know, to go against Shire. You know, at least some of these guys will come with him. Well, someone like Louis Miller said, well, I, uh, I've got towns, and I know where I can get other people, well, you know, Rupert will get other wrestlers to come in. Right, because Louis, Louis did we, still have a few towns. I think he had Stockton, Richmond, Oakland, maybe another town. I'm not sure, but he'd lost. Well, he'd already been run out a year ago from his own town of Santa Rosa that he started, and then just recently he lost his main town of, of, of uh, Sacramento. So it was probably only a matter of time in his mind before Roy came and took the rest of the towns from him, because he took the big one already. So it really, it seemed like it left Miller nothing else to do but to try to run against Roy. He, he was basically forced to do that. It was either that or go home and retire. And he clearly didn't want to do that. So he comes to a booker and a wrestler, a top one of the top heels in the, the territory. He comes to you and he, he pitches you this idea, I guess, right? Yeah. You know, and I'm sitting here now, you're talking about sour grapes and uh, what if, what if, what if, what if. I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? I never even asked Louie, can you get TV? Because the TV was in Sacramento. Uh, Louie might have had better, probably had better relations with the TV director or the, the, the TV station, the various people, program directors, the one you're, you need to, you know, to look out for. Uh, they're the ones that will select what kind well, of program. From my research I did, it, it does state, uh, at least, you know, from what I've went through, that Louis Miller, when he, formed this plan, he did have in mind to get the Sacramento TV station because he knew that the, I guess the owner or whomever was in charge there was not a fan of Roy Shire spitting on his wall of you, as you've talked about in the past and just, you know, his, his ego in general. So I, I'm not saying he could have got San Francisco TV, but I'm sure if like enough of the talent went over, it was certainly, you know, potentially there. And yeah, it's, it's very interesting. How, if you guys had gotten that TV, that would have been it. Or Roy Shire would have been just, it's just that quick. Well, if he, if Louis had had come to me and said, "Look," because um, I told him, I mean, I was interested. I let him know. Uh, well, I'll think about it. And uh, if he'd have come to me and said, uh, if he didn't mention TV, if he would have taken me for a meeting, maybe not at the TV station, but at a restaurant a discreet distance away, uh, or at his house for that matter, and the TV, uh, the people from the, the important people, the necessary people from the TV were there. And we talked, and I could guarantee him, yeah, I, I can have a TV show for you next week. Um, because even if not everybody that was on the card at the time would come along, there were enough uh, local guys 
that I could have gotten to, to be preliminary, to work the preliminary matches. I could have brought guys out of retirement, for that matter. And with me and Kevin on top, Alexi was along with it, uh, and Carl von Steiger. I'm trying to remember who else there was, but, you know, we would have had enough to, to at least start. And if we've got the only TV, now Roy's still going to, if, if it's the same TV, uh, then he's out of business, unless right. he can find another one. But in a week, two or three weeks, while he's trying to find a, another second, another TV, uh, we can get a head start to where uh, you know with a new talent, new look. And what Roy would have probably done would have been to try to hire Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, Fuji, and all the other guys back there, come right. back there. Right. Which I don't think would have worked. He oh. would have done some business, but compared against new guys and the stuff we were doing. Uh, he may would have maybe been able to promote, but I don't think we would have been successful. I think in the long run, especially if we're all the boys would have been given a percentage of the business, five percent or whatever of the gate receipts after expenses, that would be part of their salary. Uh, and maybe at the beginning they would only make a couple hundred bucks a week, depending on what we drew. Uh, if they're willing to go for it, you have to invest in this. Right. Uh, you have to invest your. You have to take a risk along with everybody else. Yeah, I, I can see it. I, I, I can see it had been a, a go. I don't know why. Well, even when after Roy let me go, I don't know why I didn't go to, go to, to. I don't. You know, I do know why. I was sick of that place. Roy made it so so distasteful. It was just you know everything was great. Business was great. You know the shows were great. Where you know the fans loved it. Everything was great. My personal life was pretty good, but I still had to deal with Roy Shire, and I'm telling you. Well, <laughs> it's like walking in. You got to walk into a sewer up to your knees yeah. to get to talk to a guy. And you you know? get tired you, of it. I get it. Oh, it's just like, you know, hey, well, the, you, got, you, you can't control it. You can't well, control your life. The narrative, you know, that's out there, and I'm sure you've heard it, or at least part of it. It, it, it sounds like it, it, Bob Roop just randomly woke up one day and decided by himself. I'm going to overthrow Roy Shire, but that's simply not the fact. Just that Shire no. had, had uh, taken over the territory from Malkowitz several, a couple decades prior. Now, you know, and then run Louis Miller out of town as well, or tried to anyway. Now, Louis Miller says, I'm not going to just sit here and let you take my towns from me. I'm going to, you know, come back and, and try to promote myself, and I'm going to bring the best I can. The guys that are already out here, the fans already know they're established stars in the city. I'm going to try to get them to work with me. It all makes sense from Louis's point of view, and he's kind of forced into this. This isn't something that people are just sitting around. Roy Shire's a great guy, but hey, we want this money. We're going to take this from him. It wasn't like that. So I love that we've gotten that part of the narrative out of the way at this point. But I think there was also a point right around this time, too, once you know Louis came to you and talked to you about potentially taking over the San Francisco territory that I think you contacted Pat Patterson about coming back into town. Yeah, I put out a feeler to Pat because I knew Pat was uh, was friends with the the manager of the TV station. He was uh, personal friends with him, so I figured if I could use Pat to get the TV, and then he could come back to work too. He'd been gone for a while. I mean, not long, but he could come back to work, and you know, and uh, he would mean something right away. That uh, you know, we'd have a good shot at getting off the ground. But he wanted to buy. He wanted to buy Roy out, and he right. and he didn't like me uh, for some reason. Uh, I I never did anything to him that I knew of except just be there. But well, you took his but, book. Uh, well, Roy took the book. Uh, <laughs> I I kind of did was accept it when right. when he offered to me. Uh, I guess Pat would have liked me better if I just give my notice and or give him my notice and let the let the cards fall where they may. But right. no, he wasn't receptive, and I wasn't going to beg. Uh, this was all new territory. This was all new stuff to me too. I hadn't ever talked about going opposition to anybody. It was a it was a big no no in the business. All the boys, all oh, guys, are talk about it all the time. They, everybody was always mad about their payoffs, and they were talking about yeah, the be opposition, but it never worked. You know, the promoters would all. I mean, we'll get into that when we talk about Knoxville. But you know that that at that time we actually did go, and uh, you'll find out what happened. But you know. It's funny that uh, they're not funny. It's interesting. I think that Louie and I were there and both of us had a plan that was not the same plan or he had a plan and I had a situation that would have 
fit his plan, and we might have been able to take that territory. Man, would that have been great. I told you what a great place it was to work. You know, you wouldn't even have to be making, you know, you wouldn't have to make 10 grand a week if you, you know, made a good living. You had that place to enjoy living in. San Francisco is a very, very great, interesting city. And, you know, you got L.A., you got all the places, Lake Tahoe, you got all those great places around there. But, uh, again, I don't regret anything that happened because I'm here with my boys and everything. Right. And things are good. I'm here with you, well, Ray. I mean, well, yeah. we wouldn't be we, here. We could tell the story, though. We're going to, we're gonna, you know, set the truth yeah. straight. You know, that's what I, yeah. I was, I was so much looking forward to this episode because I only knew bits and pieces of this before I actually did the research. And, wow, I'm, I'm a better person for it now that I go back and see really everything that transpired leading up to this and how people were essentially forced or, or maybe you, I guess you could just walk away. But uh, in my, you know, in my mind as a business person kind of forced into this situation rather than waking up, as I said, one day and just going, I'm going to be an asshole today and try to take over, you know, with something that Roy, Roy had done more than <laughs> once here. Uh, because uh, so we set the stage. We know Louis Miller came to you. He talked to you. You like the idea. You contact Pat Patterson, which is a great idea. You think Pat had in the ends maybe with the guys at the TV station, but also Pat, a great hand. You know, it'd be great to have Pat Patterson, a, a very well-known name in that territory back out there with you guys as well. But Pat says, no, I'm in the midst of trying to purchase the territory from Roy, something that never happens either. Shire not going to give up the town. Uh, but uh, at this point, you kind of turn to some of the fellow wrestlers, Kevin Sullivan, Alexis Smirnoff, and the Von Steigers. And uh, unfortunately, this is where things become awry. So I'll let you get you kind of tell that story about Kurt Von Steiger now. Well, uh, I, some time went by. I don't know how long, but it didn't take too long. Roy called me into his office and uh, told me that Carl Von Steiger had told him. Oh, was it I Carl? Did, I'm sorry. I mean, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt. Okay. Kurt, okay. Uh, sorry, Carl. That Kurt had uh, told him that I was planning to do opposition. And uh, I denied it, of course. But uh, you know, I didn't want. To, I didn't want. To, well, I didn't want to get any of the other guys in trouble. Well, I knew I had to go, and I was again. What I just said, I remember. I was fine with it because I was like a relief, like oh my god. I mean, it, it, you know, it was all that is great. You know, everything we talked about is great, except I was busy every day, like for most of the day, and at night, and then. As soon as one show was over, I had to be thinking about the next one in that town and the next one the next night. And, you know, we had if we had a day off, once in a while I had to wear a thaw. I might go up to Tahoe. I had a buddy, Paul DeMarco, who was hiding out in the hills up there. <laughs> and I, I would go up and see him and take him a bag of rice and some beans or something. You know, but most of the time it was like the, the, the business owned me. You know, the other guys, they had all kinds of time to play and go at the beach and do all these kind of things that I didn't, you know, I just didn't have the time to do it. So, you know, having that response, and plus it was, I wasn't making like twice what everybody else was making. I was only making a few hundred bucks more than, than uh, from my booking efforts, which is stupid on my part. As soon as business really increased, I should have gone to Roy and, you know, asked him to add a thousand bucks a week to my pay. But hindsight's always twenty twenty. For anybody out there, first of all, I want to ask a question. Why, if somebody does a successful takeover of somebody else's business, uh, especially when before they do that, they've improved the quality of that business, as we had done out there, why would you be mad at someone who came to force and did that? That's the American way. That's the American way of doing that kind of thing, of you know, getting out there and struggling to reach the top and the you beat your top by overcoming someone else. Now, the fact that Roy left himself vulnerable to do that, that's on Roy. That's not on me. Well, I didn't have a contract with Roy, a personal service contract or anything. Everything was word of mouth. And just like he did Louis Miller, of you just deep stitched him and cast him out, they didn't have a contract either. But he just like he did that, why should I treat why should Roy be treated any differently? Why should he be given some special kind of consideration because he's a promoter? No, i afraid that's not enough. Like I said, if you're someone like Paul Bosch and there was only one or two of him, then you got my respect and my loyalty. You're decent to me, I'm gonna be loyal to you. But if you're like Roy Shires, who's only using me for his end, he's making a lot more money out of it than I am. 
you know, if he'd have been smart, he'd have, he'd have given me a five hundred dollar a week raise. Uh, that's the way to get your loyalty. Uh, BS walks with money talks. So, but he didn't, and so I didn't either. All I know is that he made it so unpleasant just to work for him that uh, he had to be in control. And there's a way to be in control of people that even if you can't make them happy, you can control them by making them miserable. And the thing, misery loves company, is absolutely true. There's a bunch of people in life, I call them spoilers. They can't do anything positive for you, but boy, they can sure make you unhappy. And they, they'll go out of their way to do it. I have some very close friends. I'm lucky. I have this, I have more than on just one hand. I can count on the fingers. I've got a fortune. I'm talking about real friends, people I'll do anything for and, my, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But as far as acquaintances, not, not a lot because, uh, you know, I'm a person, one thing, I'm my age. And, uh, and not, not that I dislike people, but especially now with the political divide in this country and everything, and I'm, I've always been fun, be, fine being alone anyway. I can uh, be alone with my own thoughts. It's fine, too. That said, I'm glad you're out there listening to this stuff and listening to me babble. I wrote something in a, a Facebook post the other day. I said I, uh, I wanted to thank everybody who pays any attention to my activities because uh, without it, I might as well just uh, quit reaching out and uh, walk around babbling to myself. But um, if it's babble, I'm glad to share it with you. I kind of got off track here a little bit, Ray. You want to get us get sure. us back on, I was gonna on say, the main speak, line? I was going to say, speaking of babbling, <laughs> just, yeah. Just, yeah, having yeah. Some, just having some well, fun. Was, but uh, an example, of course. No, no. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but so we were just talking about Kurt Von Steiger blowing the whistle, going and telling Roy Shire. And what I felt was really interesting here, and it's actually in the Rock Rims book, but it's also, according to you, you've already talked about this part in the past, that when Shire found out and called you to his office and had this conversation, he wasn't ranting and raving. He wasn't yelling or screaming. He wasn't cursing at you. He simply said, you know, well, I got to give you your notice, Bob. I know what's going on here. So you think he'd be a little more shocked, but he knew he knew what business was all about. He knew what he had done. So there was no reason to really come at you hard. And the funniest part of all of this is lots of people who weren't even alive when this happened or were just simply fans they absolutely loathe you for this whole situation, Bob. And obviously, there's somebody else out there who stirs the pot uh, for this whole situation. We're going to get to that in later episodes. But uh, right now, I just want to look at this just real quick. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at this. You're the U.S. champion when this happens. If I was really concerned as a promoter, the first thing I would do is what? I would make you go drop the belt. Or at the very yeah, least, if I belt. really didn't trust you, I would just strip you of the belt. Like, I don't even believe you're going to show up tomorrow. Yeah. So none of that happens. He actually leaves the belt on you. He essentially, you keep the belt over Kevin Sullivan on December 3rd. You hold the belt the whole month of December. And thanks to super fan Jeff Sharkey, who keeps a record of all of the matches you can find of Bob Roop. Thank you for sending in the results, by the way, Jeff. He's, he's kind of a Bob Roop lookalike. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, Bob. but uh, Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, I was just looking at some of the matches here. This is this is several weeks after the whistle was blown, after you were given notice that you're leaving at the beginning of January here. We're going into Christmas. Pepper Gomez, you're working him. You're doing a few jobs on the house shows, non-title matches. But on TV here, I found this interesting. <coughs> December 29th, Kevin Sol or excuse me, U.S. champion Bob Roop in Sacramento – defeats Kevin Sullivan. So Sullivan had given his notice, and you're given your notice from Roy, and you're still picking up wins heading into the new year. Even beating, listen to this, guys, San Francisco, Cal Palace, December the 30th, you return for the first time since that last Sullivan cage match. It's U.S. champion Bob Roop beating the, Ray Stevens comes back in the town. I don't know if you remember wrestling Ray here on the way out, but you actually go over on Stevens of all people. So if Shire really loathed you, I think this would have been the perfect time to switch the belts, or at least you do the job. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't remember it. That's mind boggling, too. I wonder, has anybody got that match? I don't know. I'd have to look into that. You know, that's a house show match, so they would have had to shown a little film footage on TV for it to even be out there because right, it was in, right. in the Cow Palace. I hope right. it exists. That would be really, really fun to, to find. But we fast forward yep. the following day in TV, too. It's Dean Ho. He beats you in a non title match on TV. And that's to set up Dean Ho taking the belt from you in the first week of January. But it's it's funny here. We look at this. You've been outed. Roy Shire knows what's going on. And you're still 
headlining uh, events as the champion, beating Kevin Sullivan, beating Ray the Crippler Stevens, winning matches on TV. In fact, your final match on TV, January the 7th, it's Bob Roop and Les Thornton defeating the team of Ted Heath and Kevin Sullivan. So your final TV appearance, you're still getting put over. You know, I'm sitting here uh, reacting mentally, cognitively, as you say that. First of all, in Roy's office, if Roy called me in there and, and fires me, and then now all of a sudden, now you're doing the Lonnie Man, you dumb SOB and all that. What's to keep me from wiping up the floor with him? I mean, Roy, I, you know, Roy was 50 or whatever. I'm a young guy in my prime, an Olympian, about 50 pounds bigger than him. And I can hand him, you know, put one hand behind my back and wipe the walls with him. So, yeah, he was going to be, uh, he was going to, in fact, he was as nice as he'd ever been to me. And... I think my motive, why would I stick around? First of all, his night, his worst case scenario is I leave that day and take the belt with me, um, just out of spite, you know. I mean, he could talk all he wants about it, he'll go to court and all that, but, you know, you're talking about a year down the line, uh, if that. So I think the reason I, I agreed to stay around was probably, boy, I'll tell you, in fact, I know. Uh, if I was going to get my money from Roy, uh, I had to stick around and wrestle because Roy paid two weeks behind. So if I left that day, I would be missing out on, well, if I hadn't gotten paid for that week yet, I would you be likely paying, weren't going to get paid for that Kevin Sullivan cage match. No. And I wouldn't have gotten paid for the last two weeks before that. So I would have, you know, well, he's talking about three or $4,000. I, I can't remember what I was making, but. It was at least a grand a week. It might have been, I don't know, it might have been 15. I don't remember. But, you know, we're talking about some serious money. And, you know, there's kind of relief in a way to, to have the all that responsibility off my shoulders. Uh, nobody else, you know, got in trouble. I mean, I took the blame or, you know, I, I denied it in a sense. I said, yeah, well, maybe it was talked about but just by me. I didn't mention Louis Miller or anybody else. Yeah, I stuck around. And, and what I did was every night for the next two weeks. You know, I mentioned a while back about Roy, talking to Roy about working a TV show and he did not, not getting paid for it. Another thing Roy did, and I, I mentioned this in a past show, was that he paid you two weeks behind. Then if you left, he still owed you two weeks. Well, if you weren't ever coming back, uh, he wouldn't send you the money. If he didn't want you to come back, he wouldn't get paid. So he would steal, you know, a couple grand, whatever from you. So that was in my consideration, too. And at this point, it was a point of pride between me and him. He had the final ha-ha by being able to, you know, I had to give my notice. But I thought, well, at least I'm going to get my money out of it. So Terry Garvin and I had, Terry was his road manager for most of the shows. And uh, uh, Terry and I had kind of a relationship, you know, with mutual respect, whatever. So I, 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 had, I got draws from Terry for every night for the next Two weeks, I think. I, my, at that time, two week notice was. So you were taking those <clears throat> at the time. You were trying to take some of those two weeks of pay that you you expected yeah. not to be getting. Right? Okay. I was taking two or three hundred. You know, I wasn't taking more than I had coming, but I was taking what about approximately what I get paid for each town. I was taking that every night. I didn't try to take more than I had coming, but uh, at least as much or you know as close to it as I could get. And I I went by past. I, I knew what I knew what the gates were. And that's why I stuck around. Well, what happened? Now, let's fast forward. When I go down to uh, L.A. to to wrestle, you know, to wrestle Andre, right. uh, I got suspended. And the reason I got suspended was that Roy went to the uh, California Athletic Commission in Sacramento who said that I had uh, stolen money from him. And that's why I was suspended. Now, it's one thing to be suspended in California, but if you're suspended with the Athletic Commission anywhere, you're suspended by Athletic Commissioner's you're suspended by any state that has an athletic commission, which was 28 states at the time. So I was basically in 28 states of the union. I wasn't that, you know, New York, for example, uh, you, you know, you, I wasn't eligible to work. So before I could even leave California and, uh, you know, head back east to more familiar territory, I had to get unsuspended. Now, uh, so the next uh, athletic commission meeting was, I don't know, it was one a month, and so... Well, I have order... it all right here. Uh, let me pull it up. 
Okay. Let's see. Well, see, well, here's the story. It goes something along the lines of, well, so they had you drop the belt to Dean Ho. You were the U.S. Mm. champion. Drop the belt to Dean Ho on June 6th, 1978. Mm. But it was in Las Vegas, and they wanted to do, they mm. wanted you to do it again, I believe, in Sacramento. But you, you'd stopped working shows by then. By all accounts, supposedly, you had missed three dates. In Fresno, San Jose, and Sacramento on the 11th would have been your final date where you would have dropped the belt again to the local town in, uh, for the Sacramento fans. Obviously, I'm sure that would have been aired or something along those lines. So you were still billed as the U.S. champion, even though you'd lost the belt to Dean Ho in Las Vegas already, technically. Uh, so you missed those three dates. You're done with the territory, and you're heading down to Los Angeles to work the Olympic Andre the Giant in the big battle royal. So you were talking about a date. It says that you appeared at the commission's hearing on January 24th, even though the case was not on the agenda, you were able to plead, plead your case without Roy being in attendance. And I guess that's kind of where it took place because you guys were not on the agenda until February and you showed up the month prior. So February 21st was the date of your, your appearance, but you come to the January 24th meeting instead, Roy Shire's not there and you have some sort of conversation to get your license reinstated. Yeah, uh, I knew I had to. I was staying with Jay York down in uh, Van Nuys, a uh, suburb of uh, inner city in Los Angeles. I was staying down there with him. Great guy, man. What a, what a character. Uh, we'll get into that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so I knew I wanted to get my license back, of course. And, you know, you got to go. I had to go before the commission. Well, you you couldn't get on the, and before the commission without being scheduled. You had to be on the agenda. And it was too late for that month to get on the agenda, which meant I was going to have to wait another month. So I just went. I thought I'd take my chances. I just went up there. Well, it turns out on the commission, one of the commissioners is a woman named Olga Corbett. And she was uh, uh, from like Hungary, uh, one of the Middle European countries, had been a, a, like a shot put or a, I think a hammer thrower. And she had married, uh, there was an American Olympian hammer thrower named Harold Connolly. He had married her, and she was back now in the United States was an American citizen, obviously to the point where she was an athletic commissioner. And uh, so here's this ex-Olympian. Well, we were on the same Olympic. I mean, we were at the same Olympics in 68. So I didn't know that when I got there. And a, another aside, one of the people at that meeting was a woman called Eileen Eaton. She was the Los uh, Mike. Yes, Lavelle's Michael Bell's mothers. mother. Yeah, and big, big, big cheese. She was a boy. You talk about someone, a big black widow spider. She was kind of a, what, some of the power just exuded from her. That's what I hear. And yeah, I just she just was, I mean, she wasn't like showy or flighty. She was quiet, but she, you, you got the people around her just gave off this intimidation. You think about all the revenue she provided for the California Athletic Commissioner. And that's where Shires had some clout because, you know, they got money from all the California towns. Right. So, you know, both of them were, you know, giving, making a lot of money for the commission. So obviously they had some clout. Well, anyway, they, when they got, when they had a break, and I listened to the first hour or whatever, and then they had a break. I went up, I just walked up to the front and I, I introduced myself to this Olga Corbett, Connolly. And I, you know, I polite, I introduced myself, but I explained the situation. I said, I've been suspended from working without any trial or any, you know, I didn't have a chance to, to say, you know, to plead my case. And, you know, I, I'm out of work. And so in order to get my, my license back, I'm just curious, is there any way that you could fit me into, you know, otherwise, you know, I'm out in the, just out of work and out in the blue for another month. Is there any way you could fit me on the docket? And she did. And all I did was stand up. Now, there was a the athletic commissioner from San Francisco was there. He was president at that meeting. So when I just stood up and sold my case, I said, yes, I did take money from uh, the gate receipts from Mr. Scherer, but it's money I had coming. I had my, I took a draw and we were allowed to do that. Otherwise, how could I have gotten the money? Anyway, I, you know, I sworn I'd tell the truth and all that. So they voted and they said, well, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> your license is suspended or is re reinstated. So I left there. I had my license back. So they granted the request just like that. Nice little yeah. uh, situation. That's cool that somebody on the board was actually a wrestling promoter. Well, she didn't really do the promoting per se, but she certainly, you know, she was making the money down there. In the, she was uh, an she, oh, Eileen Eaton, you mean? Yes, yes. 
But no, what was nice was having Olga Corbett on the on the. Well, she respected committee. you, Bob. You guys were, you know, she in did. the Olympics. Well, yeah, so. you're talking to a fellow Olympian. How many sure. of those did she have come into her? <laughs> right. you know, well, yeah. Maybe a few. But yeah, that was nice. Well, you know, oh wait a minute, I left out something. When I gave my talk at the commission, they asked the San Francisco Rustin Commissioner what he knew about it. Well, he didn't know anything about it. And if I'd been stealing money, you would have think he'd have known about it. So. Right. Uh, he couldn't say anything. So with no testimony from him, they granted me my license back. So now it's the next month and Roy comes up, he makes his case. And of course, Roy Sir's style, he's probably called them all SOBs and whatever. But he, if he didn't at first, when they turned down his, his request for them to re-disqualify me, they said, no, we're going to, we heard Mr. Roop's uh, testimony and uh, your, your representative here uh, from the commission couldn't substantiate any of the charges that were made against him. So uh, we gave him his license back, and we, that's going to be our decision. Sheriffs call them all SOBs, and he said it. Well, you son of a bitch, you. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's man. charming. charming I, could, I would have loved to have been there for that one. <laughs> oh, I would have given anything well, for that. Well, that was, that was 11 months in the San Francisco territory. We told the story from beginning to end, how you got the book, uh, the great feuds you had with Kevin Sullivan, some of the other talent in town. Al Madrill didn't last very long, but Pepper Gomez was there. We saw the recreation of the ladder angle. Alexis Smirnoff through there. We heard about the Von Steigers, a very popular heel tag team in their time. But uh, it's time to say goodbye to the San Francisco territory now. But looking back, man, it's amazing what you did with the territory, going from 2,000 a night to 4,000 a night to the very next show, Nearly 12,000 strong at the Cow Palace for every card for the rest of your time booking there, all the way through the month of December, at least. And I don't know what happens here shortly thereafter. I know Dean Ho, the U.S. champion, once again here pretty soon. I don't know what happens with the cards here. I don't know if they stay on top for a while because it was hot or if everything drops off, tapers off pretty fast after this. But I do know while you were there, the facts don't lie in terms of drawing money and fan interest. So you, you pack the house. You made Roy all kinds of money. Hopefully you took a little bit of that home with you as well. But the Roop era, one of the strongest of the entire 1970s in the big time wrestling promotion in the Bay Area. What a what a trip. Uh, <laughs> everything that happened this year from the inside the ring stories with Kevin Sullivan to the outside the ring stories with Roy Shire. I am so happy to have been here and listen to you tell this story firsthand. Well, thanks, Ray. I, uh, I I really appreciate you giving me the wherewithal and the uh, avenue uh, to tell the story. You know, you know, and our listener out there, thank you again for being there. I say it every time because I mean it every time. Without you, we don't need to be here. We, we wouldn't be here. So I hope you find it interesting. We've got a lot more to talk about. My memory isn't as bad in most cases as it was today. <laughs> Well, you remember the hearing uh, very again, well. You, my you, motive, you knew my the thi- Bob, you, you remember the things that were important because there were the parts where you were involved, at least outside of the business, right. the stuff with Roy Shire, the stuff with Louis Miller, and of course, the hearing stuff, which I never saw, I never heard tell in such detail before. So I, I greatly appreciate that as well. Well, thanks, Ray. And what, for, for our listeners, what I will do, what I do remember of my matches from that long ago, and again, I, not just my own, I watched thousands of matches as a booker. So, you know, how much, you know, you got like a year of continual action in your head of matches you saw, and only part of those in there are belong to you. It's hard sometimes to find them. But what I can do is what I did today is I can tell you again what was going on outside the ring, especially with me, and what cases where I know and, and my contemporaries as well. And I hope that that will suffice for now. And as we move along, uh, we're going to share as much as we can, and I'll, I, my memory is going to, I'm going to still be there. So thank you for today. Uh, I've had a lot, I've had a great time, Ray. Thank you. Well, you know, I just want to touch, uh, recap a couple of things here with you, Bob, as we close out the okay. show. If you got a few more minutes, uh, so okay. we kind of covered a different narrative here. Everybody had always told the story. Well, Bob Rube tried to steal San Francisco. Well, there was a lot more to it than that. First of all, Roy Short, if you if you believe in stealing a town. Roy Shire stole San Francisco from Malkowitz first. So there's that. And as somebody said to me on Facebook, does that make it okay when Bob does it? I said, does that make it not okay when Roy Shire? I mean, you can't have one without the other. You know what I mean? And and it wasn't you waking up one day and deciding, I want to take this town. It was 
Louis Miller being forced, you know, forced his hand. He, he got his territory stolen from him, if you, if you can steal a territory. And he said, I, I just want to keep working. I want to keep running the shows. I want to keep running, uh, promoting professional wrestling. And he comes to you and you say, hey, that's a great idea. Let's try to get it going. And you call up the troops. You talk to Kevin Sullivan, Smirnoff, the Von Steigers, Pat Patterson. And unfortunately, you know, it doesn't work out. Roy Shire says, we got to let you go. And you stay on board for another month as the champion, mind you guys, winning matches over the likes of Ray Stevens. So that's how mad Roy Shire was about this whole thing. But the real truth, so far off from the narrative, that's, that's, it's just sad and scary that people just begin telling a story and it just gets bigger and more incredulous over time that Bob Roop on his own woke up and decided to take a territory. Simply not the case. And uh, we won't get into it here, Bob, because it takes place after your time in San Francisco. But it wasn't too much after Louis Miller and Bob Roop, th- th- that whole fiasco, that the M&M promotions, that's Blackjack Mulligan and Dick Murdoch, came in and also tried to take over the territory using Terry Garvin's help. Garvin, a referee at the time by Shire, and apparently you know held, handled some money as well, according to you. But it was right. Murdoch, Murdoch and Mulligan began airing their Amarillo stuff because they brought the, bought the Amarillo territory from the Funks by that point. They were airing their shows locally there in San Francisco, hoping to take the town. But nobody wants to talk about that. <laughs> well, again, I have a hard time fathoming. I mean, I guess if you're a loyal wrestling fan, uh, you feel like Roy Shires, uh, he earned some kind of medal of honor or something for giving you wrestling. Uh, well, that's fine. But, you know, again, it, it'd be one thing if someone would try to, like, take over a professional uh, football team or something like that by force uh, because you can't legally. And by the same token, it's not illegal if you do it in pro wrestling because you're stealing something that has already been stolen, except for this fact. It doesn't belong to anybody. It only belongs to the person who can hold it. So you're not stealing anything. It's there for the taking. So anybody said, well, Let's see, I can stay at work here for a thousand bucks a week, or I can take a risk here and maybe in a year I'm making ten thousand bucks a week. Let me think. Which one do I want to do? Well, if you're welcome if you're willing to stay at work for the ten grand, when there's a good chance you can make that ten grand, well then you were different. I'm not saying you're wrong, but please don't tell me I am either. Because that's the American way of always trying to better yourself. Well, somehow in all of this, like 5% of the narrative is only out there. 5% of the story has been repeated over time. Everything else forgotten. I bet if you told somebody when they go, well, Bob Rube tried to take San Francisco, and I said Louis Miller, they'd say, who the hell is that? I'd say 99% of the population would say that back. And and regardless of what one Facebook user said to me, and and again, about opinions and facts, I think I talked about that last time we were talking San Francisco, when he was telling me that I was stating facts and he was calling them Uh opinions, I said, no, these actually happened. And I referenced several you know, places for him to go find these facts, and he kind of disappeared on me. Imagine that. But here we are, guys. Uh, these are indeed the facts. They're not stories, according to me or Bob. These are facts, and there are many sources out there that state these facts. Many wrestling historians, West Coast historians, San Francisco wrestling historians, their sites online, the Rock Rims books that I've referenced, they all tell the same story that we discussed here a little more detailed from you, Bob, but the, all of these facts are out there if you want to go actually find them. And I hope after today, outside of people who don't care about facts, just a good story, hopefully we have enlightened a lot of students of the game, if you will, who want to know the true stories here in the world of professional wrestling. And this really kills the whole Bob Roop tried to steal two territories narrative, narrative that's out there, at least for me, at least in the way that stories the story's been told in the past several decades. And as you said, I don't know that you can steal a territory, and I can't wait until we dissect the Knoxville piece in the coming weeks as well, because you've been given a ton of ammunition to discuss a situation you were simply going to let go, move on from. Before we began the entire podcast here, you said, eh, you know, we'll, we'll touch on it, and I want to be done. And you kind of did that in the first episode, but, uh, you, know, a, you know, some people just don't know when to shut up. And basically, just much like Louis Miller got forced his hand, you've been forced your hand based on some exaggerated claims and hearsay and supposed assumptions uh, made on another podcast. But that's another story for another time uh, coming coming very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask something, Ray. Perhaps the 
Bob Roop stole the territory, and he should be, you know, by, you know, he should be uh, held. Perhaps that's a result of I don't know how San Francisco did after I left. If within a year it went in the toilet, uh, they very well could blame me, and they say, well, that wouldn't have happened if Bob Roop had hadn't tried to steal the territory. No, if I hadn't been there to take the book. Uh, and Shar kept running it the way he was running, it would have gone in the toilet before then. Or it wouldn't have gotten any better because right. he didn't know any, he didn't know how to do it any differently. And he wasn't going to trust anybody else. Uh, he was foolish to trust me. But he did. And I made him a lot of money. If you feel sorry for Roy Shire, uh, I made him a lot more money he made me. Let's put it that way. Uh, I, I just don't out. know. I'm, I'm sure people could, but uh, I don't know. How people could could blame you for the demise of the San Francisco territory simply because it was you know booming when you left, right? So right, <laughs> it's not like right. Kevin Sullivan already given his notice due to poor booking. That's you know Sullivan has said that himself, and you know Shire, Shire got rid of you, and he kept, you know he kept you around for another month, and, and then you left the territory. So two guys leave the territory. They were two guys that were on top, but that's by their own accord for one one way or another. So that doesn't mean the territory needs to dry up. It's not like you killed the territory and took 10 people with you. What, you know, like we're not talking Knoxville or anything like that here. So it's just odd that, you know, that, that's a narrative that might be out there. I haven't heard that necessarily, but I do know, you know, I can't remember exactly when Shire loses TV, but that's pretty much the beginning of the end. Well, if, yeah, if you want to blame somebody for killing their territory, blame Roy Shire, because I'm sure he didn't trust anybody else to, to be running the show after I left. Uh, so he was running again, the only way he knew how. And now he went back to the same old tired stuff. And if it went in the toilet, that's the reason why. One is a reaction to what we had done. If I had stayed there, if Roy had been smart, well, we won't even go there. But uh, if we stayed there another year, it would have been okay. It would have been great for another year because I would have been bringing other people in. People would have been hearing about San Francisco doing great and people making money. I would have been getting calls from top people. Hey, Bob, you got room? Or when you got room, think about me. You know, from top heels, top baby faces all over the country. So, yeah, it would have been even bigger. But what could have been what should have been, it's, it is what it is. But right. I'll, 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 I'll take whatever credit or blame you want to give me. I don't care do anything about it. As long as the story's out there now, as long as yeah. the facts are out there, yeah. as long as we've heard it from the person himself, Bob Roop, You've shared the story, your version of everything. And honestly, outside of just some personal conversations you had, there's nothing conflicting here. The, everything you're saying is the same thing that I looked up and researched. Now, of course, you have more firsthand experience, more details of the conversations and things to really enlighten us. But really, the, the basic facts were already out there. So none of this is what people want to call a liar. You, you can continue to dispute it if you're just that type of person. But sure. You know, everything I've looked at, they all run the same. And usually from my experience, when 10 people say the same exact thing, it's probably true. Yep. But uh, Bob, I, I want to thank you so much for this long trip through San Francisco. What started off, I thought it was going to be a quick three show journey. I think we went about four shows here with it, but man, worth it. Every minute of it, I wouldn't give back a second of it. Just learning so many new things on top of everything I researched. And this episode here today, I'm just glad. I, it's like a cathartic moment for me. I'm happy that this is out there now. Well, thank you, Ray. I am, too. Uh, I appreciate it. It's there now. I mean, unless we have Armageddon somehow <laughs> and we all are gone, we're, we're here for history, my friend. Well, I'm going to try to bury this one in the backyard. Maybe somebody will do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to try to keep a copy somewhere. So. Well, thank you, my friend. Absolutely, Bob. I appreciate you, man. Looking forward to the new year. The next time we come to you guys, it's going to be 2024. Can't wait for that. And uh, what's on deck next? Stay tuned to social media to find out, guys. Bob, thank yeah, you. Happy, happy New Year, everybody out there. Thanks for listening. All right, guys. That's going to close it up here this week. I want to thank Bob once again so very much for educating us, enlightening us on the entire story of the Roy Shire debacle. What caused Bob to actually leave the territory? There was a lot more there than meets the eye, a lot more there than the story that's told in the general population anyway. But as we move on, so much more to cover as we head back once again next time around. More great stories from the life and times here of Mr. Bob Rupin. And remember, you can follow Bob, guys, over at facebook.com slash poor Bob Rupin. Follow me, Ray Russell, on X 
Find me there at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L A N Grenade. Also, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. So, once again, thank you guys for popping a squat on the Wrestling Stoop, as we will be back soon with more great wrestling tales from the legend himself, Bob Root.